Hello, everybody, and welcome to JS at PayPal 2021. If you all can hear me, say hello, Shruti. My name is Shruti Kapoor, and I am your host and MC. And it is my honor to welcome you to JS at PayPal 2021. We're live streaming from San Jose, California, and I want to know where you are watching this live stream from. Tell me in the comments what country you're from and what time is it there? Hello to everybody who is saying hello to me. I'm going to go ahead and get started and introduce myself first. My name is Shruti Kapoor, and I have been at PayPal for three years. And the last three years have been an amazing time. I have really enjoyed my journey with PayPal in the last three years. You can find me on Twitter at Shruti Kapoor 08, or you can also find me on Twitch at Shruti Kapoor, where I stream co-working sessions and invite you to work on your side project with me. I want to give a brief introduction of what is JS at PayPal 2021. We are really excited to revive this really popular internal JavaScript at PayPal conference. It used to be a two-day internal conference for front-end and full-stack engineers from all across PayPal Inc. to share the best practices and lessons of JavaScript web development and PayPal applications. But for the very first time, we're opening our doors to all of you, to the public. There's 1,500 people who have signed up for this conference. And we thank each one of you for being here. Thank you to everybody who has subscribed to our PayPal developers' brand new YouTube channel. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and subscribe that button. Our goal from this conference is to create an inclusive space and share our learnings with the world, plus learn from the amazing developers in the JavaScript community who have been doing great work. At this conference, we have speakers from all across PayPal Inc. We've got speakers from US, India, Singapore, Mexico, China. Your favorite JavaScript community engineers will also share their learnings in this conference. Our speakers are seasoned engineers with tons of speaking experience, but we also have speakers who are giving their talk for the very first time. At JS at PayPal, not only are we focusing on the JavaScript language itself, but also on the entire JavaScript stack. Matt Edelman will talk about enabling Next.js at PayPal in his talk today. Eve Purcello from Moon Highway will talk about using GraphQL directives, defer, and stream tomorrow in her talk. On Friday the 21st, Mike Murray will talk about how to organize chaos with GraphQL microservices. Sid from Code Sandbox will share his lessons learned from building interactive React applications. Daniel Brain is talking about our favorite topic these days, how we can build Bitcoin in JavaScript. Tanmay Gopal from Hasura is going to talk about a really important topic in GraphQL, which is building an advanced model level authorization, authorization system for GraphQL with Hasura. Dan Borner from Apollo will show how Apollo Federation can be used and show Apollo Federation in action. And Joey Nenny from PayPal will show how we use GraphQL Apollo Federation to sit back, relax, and let the graph grow. We've got tons of amazing topics for you in the next three days from all across PayPal Inc. Greg Joba will be talking about building the checkout SDK JavaScript bundles at runtime and how we include JavaScript code relevant to emergence integration. Amy Egan will talk about how you can integrate with PayPal's smart payment buttons in different front-end frameworks. Tyrus Wu, who's also one of our MCs, will talk about how you can build effective CIs and win friends. Kritika Gulati is talking about how and why leading teams with empathy is so important, especially in these times. Nick Mitchell is going to share his story about using mono reports and why he would do it again. And for those of you who are excited about the upcoming features of web, Hemant will have a talk today on new features of web in Web Can Do That. If you want to check out the full schedule, you can find it on bit.ly slash JS PayPal 2021. Now, I know that attending a conference is in pandemic virtually is not the same as attending a conference in person where you go to an actual hall. I know your MC is doing a great job, but it's still not the same. We get it. So that's why we've got some 
things planned for you, which we hope that make will make this experience more interactive for you. First of all, we've got GatherDown, and I'll share the link here. It's bit.ly slash GatherDown. And I'll pause here for a second so you can open this up in your browser and also show it here. Let me give you a brief walkthrough of what GatherDown is. So GatherDown is actually an interactive place for you to go and talk to other people, maybe play games. You can go to GatherDown like this, walk into the keynote, and you can see this talk right here by clicking on X. You can also see other people. You can maybe like sit here, talk to your friend, or just like watch the conference, go back to lobby. And let's say that you're bored and you're like, OK, I just want to like go and chill. Then you can go to the beach. Or if you want to play a game with somebody, you can go to the game room and play the games. Every table here is a different game. So we want you to go ahead and enjoy and have fun. But I know, for me, the most important part of being in a conference was the, the swags that we would get. So we're bringing that here as well to you. We're calling it scavenger hunt. And the way you can do that is every speaker today will have a code in their talk. So look for a slide like this. It will say JS at PayPal 2021, and then there will be a code in there. So something like JS PayPal, name of the speaker, and a code. Watch out for this sl slide. Take a screenshot. Make sure you have your name in this. Take five of these screenshots and then share it with us and tweet the codes out to us with the hashtag JSPayPal2021. Again, watch out for this code. Take a screenshot with your name in it. Take five of these and tweet it out to us at JSPayPal2021. We'll be picking winners at the end of this conference, and the winners will receive amazing swags. So we want you to have fun in this conference, and we want you to see, we want you to share your learnings with us. Use the hashtag JSPayPal2021 to share what you're learning, what talk you're enjoying. But also, we want to see how you are seeing this conference from your place. So maybe take a photo of you watching the conference of you from your YouTube live stream and tweet it out to us at JSPayPal2021. We would love to see your photos. Now, I promised. Uh, before I go into the next section, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us at jspaypal at paypal.com. I also want to remind everybody of our code of conduct. We are trying to make this conference an inclusive and safe environment for everybody, for our attendees, for our speakers, and for our organizers. Harassment of any kind will not be tolerated. If you see something, report it to us to our email at jspaypal at paypal.com and we will take immediate action. Thank you so much for making this space a safe space for everybody. And no, I promised dev jokes. So here's the first one. What I want you to do is I'll ask you a question, and I want you to reply back in the YouTube comment section the answer of the question. Why couldn't the React component understand the joke? And I'll give you five seconds to answer. Why couldn't the React component understand the joke? It didn't have any context. How long does a loop last? Sorry, Scott is right had no context. Next question. How long does a loop last? And I'll give you 20 seconds, because I know it takes a little bit of while. For a while. <gasps> you are right. Sorry if I'm butchering your name, Fasundo Petre. For a while. All right, last question, I promise. Where does a parallel function wash hands? Where does a parallel function wash hands? It 
Heymanth HM, you are the first one. A sink. Good job, everybody. You win. All right. Now it is my honor to invite our next speaker, our first keynote speaker, Sri Shivananda, on the stage. Sri Shivananda is the CTO of PayPal. Over to you, Sri. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Shruti. I think I have to say that uh, um, I got all the jokes and I laughed at them, but I don't think I got any of the answers. Uh, maybe the closest I came to is for a while uh, on the loop. <laughs> <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the JS at PayPal 2021. At PayPal, our aspiration is to be the payments operating system for the planet. In 2015, when we became an independent company, we had a total payment volume of less than $250 billion. Last year, we did $936 billion in payments, very close to a trillion with about 390 million active customers on our platform. As many of you may know, our aspiration by 2025 is to achieve 2.8 trillion in payment volume with about 750 million active users. While what we have achieved makes us very proud, what we have the potential for inspires us a lot. We want to make managing and moving money something that is accessible to everyone. Democratizing financial services is what our mission is all about. And that is what we've been pursuing as a company. And all this growth has been possible because of the technology journey we've been on as a company. Innovation is one of our core values, along with inclusion, collaboration, and wellness. And when we look at innovation in the company, we organize it into three horizons. Horizon one is all the innovation that happens day to day in everything everybody does at the company. And innovation being a core value, it's built into the culture of PayPal. Horizon two is what we think of in terms of the next two years, products that we're imagining right now, products that we are redoing, reaching more customers around the world. Whatever is on the roadmap for the next two years is where Horizon two innovation works. And Horizon three, is where we lay seeds for the future uh, of PayPal, and for that matter, the future of payments and financial inclusion as well. I want to quickly cover, when we think about technology outcomes, there are uh, a few things that we innovate on, five key themes that I would say. And those happen to be security, scale, stability, speed, and subsidy. I'll cover this a little bit quickly. Being in the business of trust as a company, and by the way, most companies are in the business of trust. Security is one of the most critical aspects. And as we know very well, safe yesterday is not safe enough today. Our adversaries are getting more and more sophisticated and everything that we do, whether it is building the infrastructure, building a product, or for that matter, building an experience, any application that's built must consider a security find first mindset in today's world. And given our performance and ambitions, as I've mentioned in terms of the total number of payments that we take, we need to scale to take every single transaction. So as we build everything in terms of, in terms of our apps, it needs to make sure that every transaction coming in our direction is something the platform can take as well. Now, of course, when you become a utility like PayPal, our customers count on us every single moment for every single transaction. Stability is a key need, whether it's planning for redundancy or resiliency or stability or availability, whatever you may want to call it. Stable platforms are very important to build so that you can serve all the transactions the platform has to take. Speed, which may be actually the most important theme for this conference as well. It gives us a competitive advantage. This is about making sure that we innovate faster than the rest of the industry to outcompete our competitors, to make sure that we have the attention of our users and we have their engagement and loyalty as well. Last but not the least, I, it is important for me to cover subsidy as well. When you build technology, when you build a utility, it is important to build it in a way that makes it cheaper to manage and move money through technology for us. 
And this means that we are continuously innovating to see what are the best new methods we could be using in building the products and services, building applications, building infrastructure, and building all of the security controls in a fashion that makes it much easier for our customers to onboard. And at the same time, much cheaper for our merchants, which range from anything, uh, who any person who may be selling one thing a month or one thing a year, all the way up to large enterprises that make millions of sales on a given day. When I uh, think of the technology vision at PayPal, I'm not going to depth today, but I do want to say that there is across the breadth and depth of the technology stack, we are reimagining how the whole financial system is being built. Of course, given trust is the business we are in and security is number one, we are re-engineering all our security systems based on trustless approaches. Our global edge network allows us to connect to customers very close to where they are so we can offer them the most, uh, the fastest of experiences in the most convenient of ways, one that engages them deeply, one that they desire and they deserve. Our autonomous infrastructure manages and scales itself. Our data strategy is making every developer a citizen data scientist. Our developer platforms are optimized for flow and engineering velocity. The core of our business platform is about robust identity, payments, risk, compliance, and credit platforms. When we go down to the specifics of this conference itself, Kraken, our Node.js platform, helps deliver great user experiences across the world. Our mobile app is ever evolving and there is a change that happens every single day across all the brands that we have. The introduction of GraphQL is helping us reimagine our APIs and through better expression and performance, we are upgrading our APIs to the next level and making sure that developers outside in the ecosystem can actually participate in helping us achieve our mission on behalf of the world. You've heard of product innovations like QR code and buy now, pay later. These are creating more avenues for customers to use PayPal and for us to further our mission as well. And last but not the least, our foray into blockchain and crypto will help us reshape the financial infrastructure for the long term. For many, uh, for a couple of decades now, there's been a change in the experience layer of payments and e-commerce. The underlying infrastructure that has conducted payments has remained the same. It has not changed for three decades. And what we're doing with blockchain, crypto and digital assets has an opportunity to reshape that in a way that it could start to include the 1.8 billion people in the world who are underserved by the financial systems that we have. And all this is just an extremely small window into the things that are happening at technology at PayPal. I'll shift gears and I'll talk about how we think of developers. We believe that our developers are artists. They are building experiences that touch our customers every day and delight them in ways that creates that deep engagement and loyalty that I mentioned. Whether it is through a beautiful experience on mobile or web, all through the APIs that are leveraged by our merchants, our developers are bridging commerce around the planet. We invest a lot internally in tools and systems that help create flow for developers and allow them to engage in creativity. Being a customer champion company, and in today's world, being customer champion company means to innovate on technology on behalf of our customers globally. Let me shift gears and talk a little bit about JavaScript. JavaScript is one of the most popular languages in the world. I've been looking at various programming language lists and it, it shows up as number two on the language list. Of course, I'm sure this community would contest that. In, in, of course, in the defense of, of JavaScript, it has the most jobs available across the rest of the industry as well. Today, JavaScript covers end to end of the customer stack. There's a lot happening in edge engineering approaches with JavaScript, all the way up to programming within the databases actually using JavaScript as well. So think of that stack, everything from the first thing that a customer experiences in a technology stack, all the way up to the, to the full backend. And like 
every uh, uh, great language, uh, they, it, it's pervasive. I think JavaScript is also amongst the most popular notations for data transport today. And every great language is a religion by itself. It has fanatic followership. And JavaScript most definitely has that trait, no doubt. JavaScript is an important portion of PayPal technology stack. And for that matter, any web scale technology stack in the world. At PayPal, we use it both on the client and server side. 18% of our GitHub repositories are JavaScript repositories. We have hundreds of Node.js applications that form our front end, and even a few services that are built on Node.js in our mid-tier as well. Over the years, we've seen a lot of innovation in this area. And uh, you'll hear a lot about that in the sessions that you're going to be attending over the next few days. It is an amazing agenda that the organizing team has put together for all of you. The agenda offers a rich schedule of sessions that will make for some very high density learning for everyone at the summit. But what's more exciting for me is the networking opportunities that the event offers to meet new people, share ideas. And it's been proven over and over again that the best ideas and innovation actually comes from controlled collision of intellectuals who are passionate about a common topic. I want to thank the organizing team uh, that has helped out uh, putting a great event together. And I want to wish all of you a great summit. And I wish you a, a lot of amazing learnings and ideas emerging from this event. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Sri, for setting the context um, and sharing the excitement about JavaScript at PayPal specifically. Um, thanks for sharing our dedication to building great products at PayPal and our commitment to developer productivity and community. And thank you again for making this conference possible. It's because of you that we are here. Now, Shruti, now thank I wanna... you for having me. Yeah, of course. Now I want to invite our next speaker, next keynote speaker, Matt Edelman, to the stage. Matt Edelman has been at PayPal since 2007 when he started as a web developer. He's currently managing the web platform engineering team, which provides the Node and CDN platform for PayPal.com web development. Matt is also one of our organizers. Thank you so much, Matt, and over to you. OK, there we go. Uh, thank you very much, Shruti. Um, I wrote my speech down. I'll try and read it naturally, uh, but you may notice that I'm reading. Um, I wanted to say, uh, oh, hold on a second. Let me share my presentation. This is going well. Here it comes. OK, I assume that you can see that now. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to the JS at PayPal organizers, the speakers we are about to hear from, everyone listening, and everyone else out there who has embarked on this great human experiment known as the World Wide Web. I'm grateful to have been asked to give this keynote presentation. I manage the web platform engineering team at PayPal. And in addition to using Node.js and JavaScript each day, this team's code is built into each and every node microservice at PayPal. That gives us a unique perspective and awesome responsibility. My intention is to share with you the excitement I have about JavaScript and PayPal and ramp us up into the next three days of presentations and conversations. I won't read that out loud, just enjoy that for a minute. OK, so starting from a personal perspective, what JavaScript means to me. It's probably my bias from being a JavaScript for so long. And uh, Sri um, uh, alluded to this as well. But I believe the love between JavaScripters and JavaScript is greater than any other between craftsperson and tool. I'll talk about my history with the web and JavaScript because it goes back pretty much to the beginning. I came to computers late in life, only inspired once I had visited a website for the first time 
in my university's computer lab in 1994. For a subsequent class project, I built a web page with a fellow student. Being able to save a text file and immediately render it in a browser just blew my mind. I knew that HTML wasn't programming, but it made me a creator of something that was a small part of the World Wide Web. I took a lot of pride in the crude homepage I built for myself, copied from bits and pieces of other websites. I took a first job out of college as a math teacher, but quickly gravitated towards the web again, as it was impossible to escape the gravity of the burgeoning internet industry in San Jose of the late 1990s. I found work editing HTML for marketing emails, but got quickly interested in JavaScript. I started teaching myself JavaScript from the ubiquitous, at the time, JavaScript Bible. The first script I transcribed from the Bible created a grid of squares and randomly changed the background color of the squares at random intervals. I was in my cubicle looking at the colors dancing on my browser, and frankly, I felt like some sort of wizard. From there, I became the sole UI engineer for that small startup. I was the lone JavaScripter among a sea of Java developers. During the next six or so years, I continued to use and adore JavaScript, but as the lone developer of a fairly obscure product, my skills did not grow very much. In fact, when I went to interview at Yahoo and shared my portfolio with my interviewer, he was openly appalled. His mouth was hanging open. It was embarrassing and defining. Uh, from that point, I set out to get a job where I could actually grow my skills. In 2007, I started working at PayPal, and immediately I felt part of a community of people who cared about web development and JavaScript. For the next six years, I worked in that capacity, building checkout and onboarding flows for the mobile web. Then in 2013, Node.js was introduced to PayPal. I shifted towards backend and platform work. The fact that most my, my most beloved tool, JavaScript, enabled a whole new chapter in my career speaks to its flexibility, value, and staying power. Moving on, what does JavaScript mean to the world? The web is JavaScript. The browser under people's fingertips dances with JavaScript. It responds to their input and delights or infuriates them. JavaScript makes the web come alive. And we, as JavaScripters, are crafting that. It's a pretty awesome ability and responsibility. During this pandemic, the web has kept us informed about what's happening locally and across the globe. It's helped arrange our vaccine shots. It's helped connect us to our loved ones when we cannot see them in person. JavaScript is the thread, the single thread, holding it all together. Rewinding to 2007 again. In 2007, the JavaScript ecosystem was fairly locked down at PayPal, and we were not using open source modules at all. Um, aside from YUI and PUI, which was some utilities that were built on YUI, uh, P standing for PayPal, of course, uh, we were, however, able to write our own JavaScripts, uh, which we did. In a way, the locked down ecosystem gave JavaScripters free reign to reinvent things. This may not have been the most efficient, but it was fun. There was a vibrant community of sharing and code reviews, but the working model and waterfall SDLC just couldn't keep up with the rest of the industry. So we transformed. Skipping a lot of history and all the way to today, we are able to utilize the full complement of open source modules and, and contribute back, which we do. There are a lot of JavaScripters and teams at PayPal that either own or contribute to open source modules. And with the adoption of Node.js in 2013, JavaScripters own the full stack now. We don't have the disconnect between front end and back end developers. What you see on paypal.com now versus 2007 is a testament to the skill and impact of the Node.js and full stack model. I wanted to call out that in addition to a technology ecosystem, JavaScripters at PayPal are a diverse, inclusive, and ever improving community. For those of you who don't work at PayPal, Come work here, we're hiring. Moving on. JavaScript is a serious language. It's driving worldwide information and a significant portion of the economy. It's mature at this point, and that means there are serious issues to consider that weren't as much a problem 20 years ago. 
there are nefarious actors who see an ecosystem and community as a target or means to an end. There are older applications and modules that are hard to upgrade. Bright people have created critical foundational modules and moved on. JavaScripters find themselves facing software that may be years behind and without any documentation from predecessors. But I would ask that you do two things. One, work hard to address these concerns. Two, trust in your community partners. At PayPal, those folks are your infrastructure team, like the one that I manage, which think about and take action on security and tech debt every single day. We can partner together and solve these problems, but be vigilant always. We are never done securing our code and ecosystem. Okay, the dark cloud has passed. Get your coffee or tea, charge up your noise canceling headphones, get comfortable in your ergonomic home office furniture, get ready to listen, watch and engage. We've got presentations on Bitcoin, empathy driven development, document driven design, how architecture can determine your productivity, Webpack, Apollo and GraphQL, state machines, React, Next.js, gRPC, Monorepo, web performance metrics, service workers, module federation and other component architectures. And all of this is in use at PayPal. Welcome and let's get started. I'm hiding. Sweet. Thank you so much for sharing that, Matt. Today, I learned the history of JavaScript at PayPal, which I had never heard before. But thank you, Matt, and thank you, Sri, for sharing the context of JS at PayPal, our commitment to developer community, and the work that we've been putting at JavaScript at PayPal. We are now going into our first break of the day. We'll be back at 11 AM, but don't go too far. Get a cup of coffee, because we've got amazing talks lined up. When we come back, we'll talk about building JavaScript bundles at runtime, and Greg Jopa will deliver this talk. Then Hamant will give a talk on web can do that. We'll have a 15-minute talk on how to build a send app, send money app in less than 15 minutes. And then we'll talk about console, console UI component library and shell with analytics integration by Ankita Jan. So let's go into a break. Let's go gra grab a drink. Let's go stretch, but don't go too far. We'll see you soon.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a drink. I had some water and some tea. I am excited to welcome my teammate and my coach, Greg Chopra, on the stage. Greg Chopra is a web developer working on PayPal's JavaScript SDK. Hey, Greg. Hi, Shruti. Thanks for having me. Of course. I want to give an intro of Greg. Greg lives in Chicago with his wife and two kids. In his free time, he enjoys playing guitar, which you can see here, and drums. Greg is going to be talking about PayPal's JavaScript SDK. And if you're not aware, PayPal's JavaScript SDK is designed to include only the JavaScript code that is relevant to a merchant's integration. Over to you, Greg. Awesome. Well, it's really good to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. All right, wonderful. So. I'm going to be talking about building JavaScript bundles at runtime today. As Shruti mentioned, this is a technique we use for our PayPal JS SDK, and it allows us to provide small bundle sizes over to merchants and buyers so they can have the best user experience as possible. Before we dive into the code, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Uh, I get to work with a bunch of incredible engineers here at PayPal designing the SDKs. I'm based out of Chicago with my wife and two kids, and I love music. And I've incorporated music into this talk with building out a demo SDK that uh, leverages drum samples. Awesome. So for some more context around our PayPal JavaScript SDK, here's what the code would look like if you were going to integrate it into your merchant website. And then you could render a component like the smart payment buttons and buyers can come to your website, click on those buttons to complete transactions. This is uh, just a basic script snippet I'm showing, but this is highly customizable. There's so many different payment use cases, and we leverage a single SDK script with customizable query string parameters and data attributes to make sure we can account for all those different use cases. And some specific requirements we have as we're building out our SDK is to provide an evergreen script. This means no specific version numbers are in that script URL. Instead, it's a evergreen URL where the, uh, the path does not change. That way, we can ship bug fixes, new features, experiments to merchant websites without them having to change any integration code. The, other main requirement is performance. We need our buttons and other UI components to render as fast as possible. We are not in the loading spinner game here with the SDK. Instead, we want uh, to render UI components as fast as possible and also to make them interactive right away. We don't want to render a button and then you have to wait another couple seconds for an AJAX call to complete before it's clickable. Uh, instead, we need it clickable as soon as you see it. And of course, we need our SDK to be trusted and secure. With our legacy checkout SD, checkout JS SDK, we leverage the static file approach. And kind of when you're building out a JavaScript SDK, there's two main approaches you can take. One is put a static file out there on the CDN and have everybody share that. And option two is to dynamically build that JavaScript file uh, to the specific requester's needs. The problems with that static file approach with our requirements is it made it really difficult to maintain. You know, keep in mind, we want to be able to render immediately. So that means we had to put a lot of code into this uh, checkout.js JavaScript file. Uh, every new feature we would add and every new language we would add support for would have to go into this file. And every single merchant website uh, was loading the same exact file regardless of their specific needs. Uh, the other problem is we weren't able to, you know, nicely embed any unique merchant info into the, the file around their eligibility. So in order to render right away, we didn't know much. So we consider this just a dumb render of our UI components. And we'd have to go fetch more data to learn about the merchant and uh, to improve those components. So those are some of the problems with the static file approach. And that led us over to the... Uh, the architecture of dynamically building bundles at runtime. Here's a picture of my Delilah and her cool sunglasses. Um, and you know, doing a dynamic bundling at runtime is cool. It's fun. And 
the main benefit we get out of there is small bundle sizes and serving up the merchant uh, websites with only the features they need. When we switched from the static file approach over to this dynamic SDK approach, we are able to slim down our bundle and improve our render rendering times. And we leverage the query string parameter for customization. And here in the slide, you can see a uh, client ID for uniquely identifying the merchant and then other optional query string parameters for customizing uh, the products being loaded through the SDK. You know, it's not just the buttons that I showed previously. There's credit messaging, there's credit card forms, there's marks, and all of these features are configurable. The other big advantage to dynamically bundling the SDK at runtime is we can actually query data based on that client ID, based on the query string, and embed some merchant-specific rules into the JavaScript SDK. So previously, I was talking about with Checkout JS where we'd have to go and make an AJAX call from the browser to load more specific merchant configure information. Uh, with this dynamic script approach, we don't have to do that anymore. We can just embed that code right into the script itself because each merchant is getting their own kind of unique SDK. And here's my Easter egg slide here. And Delilah had to make the slide too, so take a screenshot. Awesome. So let's dive into some code here. For I built a demo app that I want to present, and I leveraged ES Build as the bundling tool for this demo. Uh, Webpack or Rollup could be used as well, uh, but the the main features I wanted to dive into are dead code elimination. Uh, the different bundling formats, uh, providing a debug mode for optional minification, and how to kind of leverage these build tools instead of you know writing to a specific file, um, get the results into memory, and then be able to respond with it in a route and save it into cache. Awesome. So let's talk about dead code um, elimination and also referred to as tree shaking. I put a picture of my son, Mike, on the slide here. He's getting mad about uh, a stick that broke, which made me think of tree shaking. But this uh, feature is the way we eliminate unused code for merchant integrations. So it's uh, called the define option with ES build. And we take our customizable query string that the merchant will uh, put in when they're requesting the SDK. And then we leverage those values from the query string or from the API lookup from GraphQL to get the specific flags back around what those settings should be. So when we're building the bundle here for my demo, I have different drum uh, instruments. So the snare or the kick drum or hi-hat. And then based on the query string parameters, those modules will either be included in the bundle or they will not be included in the bundle. And to give you some specific code here, on the left-hand side of the snippet, we see if, and then this global variable called hi-hat. That would be checked into my source code. And then at build time, using this uh, define feature, it's going to uh, replace those global variables, like hi-hat, with either true or false. And then on the minification step, it, the minifier will come across this code and be like, oh, that if statement you know, if false is always false, it's never going to be hit. Let me just remove this code from the bundle altogether since it's it's dead code that will never get hit. So that's how we're able to shape our bundle uh, based on what the query string parameters are passed in. So, and here's the specific ES build uh, code snippet. You, you can see define being passed in. That was the object that I showed on the previous slide. Uh, instead of outputting to a file, which you'd normally do when using a bundler. Instead, we are using the write uh, option and setting that to false. So instead of writing to a specific file, we're able to get the results back here in the build output variable. And then we can go ahead and uh, save that into cache and return that by our, our uh, node web server route. The other uh, features to call out here are the, uh, the minify option, uh, just a Boolean flag in this uh, format option that I'm going to go to into the next slide. The minify is just true or false. And if you want to be able to debug your SDK, you can you know, set that to true or false. 
And then format is really interesting. Let's I go to the next slide to see what we can do here. So when building a JavaScript bundle or a JavaScript SDK, you want to think about how the integration code is going to look like. And this is kind of the standard uh, way that uh, most SDKs today are implemented. They, they load a script tag, um, and that's going to add some unique behavior to the window object. For example, it, with our PayPal SDK, we'll declare window.paypal or some customizable window name that you give us. Uh, in this specific example, I did drums as the global object. And then all of my functions that are the public interface for my SDK would be based off of that uh, global window object. And this is uh, referred to as IAFE. And I totally forgot what that stands for. But think of it as the kind of global uh, window object approach for bundling. The second one, which is really exciting, is a new feature of the browsers uh, is ESM. And this is where we can have a script tag of type module. So previously, we had to use script source to load the SDK. With this um, ESM, ESM format, we can actually use the import statement right in the script tag, as long as it's type module, and get that uh, from our SDK. And as long as we have the right core settings, this SDK script could be loaded on any website in the world, regardless if it's you know first party or third party. And we can import out the features we want to use. And there's no pollution to the global window object with this approach. So this could be a way with building a JavaScript SDK that you can you know, support the window object approach that works fine in IE11 and older browsers, but allow merchants the ability, if they only care about new browsers, to opt into this ESM feature and you know, get um, a more optimized bundle that's you know not polyfilling old, uh, newer features and is able to leverage um, ESM. Awesome. So I've showed some code snippets. I want to go ahead and jump into a demo here. So my plan is to first share the demo and then dive into the code that explains the demo more. So I'll stop sharing my slides here. And we'll jump over. Awesome. So this is a little hard to see, but I have a demo application hosted on Heroku. And here, actually, we'll jump over here first. Here is the demo application. And the route here is slash SDK slash JS. And then it has um, components equal kick into the query string. And as I demo this, I want you to focus on the size of the SDK response that comes back here. So when requesting just a single component here is the kick, we're at um, about 500 kilobytes. And I'm going to go ahead and add in some more drum samples. Let's go ahead and add in the snare here. And we're doing the dynamic bundling. And you can see the SDK comes back. And it's a little bigger because it's got in, um, the snare sample embedded into it. And if we go ahead and load our final sample of the hi-hat, you can see um, the original size of the SDK. All right. Um, and as you can see here, the query string is actually um, deciding what's included in the response using that ES build define feature. So these query string parameters of what component are um, indicating what's loaded. Awesome. So you know that doesn't really make sense when we're just looking at a bunch of text. But knowing that based on our query string parameters, we get either a smaller or bigger, bigger bundle based on what we request. Uh, how this would be used, and as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, how I incorporated music here, is I built kind of a, um, a drum sequencers that will play audio when you click on one of these two buttons. And I didn't want to have any delay with these buttons. I wanted, as soon as they render, I wanted them to be clickable, similar to our requirements with the PayPal buttons loaded through our SDK. And let me go ahead and play from my phone here. I had trouble getting my desktop audio to share. But when I click on this Play Basic button with all of the samples loaded, sorry, one second. 
So you should be hearing through your audio just a simple uh, drum beat here on eighth notes, and you can hear the snare, the open hi-hat at the beginning, and the kick drum as well. And when I go to the next demo here, where I just load, let's see. If I just load the snare, for example, let me play that audio for you. So we have the hi-hat is just the metronome that's always there, and then you can hear a snare beat. But it's a, a cool illustration with audio about how you can dynamically build a bundle. Um, the more features, the more drums you're hearing in the audio, the less features you request, the less drum features, and the smaller the bundle. Awesome. And now let's kind of uh, jump into the code and how we did that. The I'm going to geek out a little bit about the Web Audio API. That's a kind of a newer JavaScript feature of the browsers, and nearly every browser has implemented that now. Uh, I leveraged that for this demo and kind of just starting off super basic is we have, we're looking at the GitHub repo. This is open source called the bundling server example. Um, starting off with just a simple wave file or think of it like an MP3, a binary file that represents that sound. So these are like one second sound clips of either a kick drum or um, a hi-hat that are inside this repo. And with binary data, you know, we can't put that into text in a JavaScript SDK. So I needed to base 64 and code it. And that's what we're looking at here. We have the original wave version of a binary file and then a text version in a base 64 kind of encoded format. The thought is how can I get a giant JavaScript bundle as quickly as possible? So that's where the idea of, hey, what if I just base 64 some binary data and include that into my bundle? And that's how, you know, which is a small amount of actual JavaScript code in these big base 64 encoded files, we got up to over a megabyte in our final bundle when all the features are included. So as we jump back over here into this repo, you'll see that there's about six different applications or packages. We reviewed the drum samples one and I uh, built a generic drum sequencer that's super basic. Um, is a sequencer, if you haven't played around with those before, that's able to take those samples, like you know the one second snare hit, and schedule them. Uh, so you can actually um, create a cool drum beat that's just kind of based on um, either quarter notes or eighth notes or however uh, you divvy up the track. So for my example, I'm doing eighth notes. Each uh, instrument is just past um, a string that has a length of eight. One equals play the thing, and zero equals don't play the thing. So it's a very simple, easy way to start creating uh, some drum music by uh, switching around these uh, settings. And like I said, it's, it's uh, just doing eighth notes, but uh, sequencers could be uh, doing much more complex things. So we have the sequencer as an example in here. And as I jump back, there's two different buttons. There's the basic buttons and advanced buttons, and they're just kind of leveraging the drum sequencer. The, there is also this SDK release repo, and I wanted to share this because when you're building an SDK, you need some way to enable a team of multiple developers to work on their single feature um, and with their team, but then to be able to contribute that back up to the bigger SDK. And the way we solve that at PayPal is we have kind of a single repo dedicated to grabbing all the components that make up the SDK. And that way you can have a specific version, um, uh, a specific version release of your SDK. And the dynamic bundling server can leverage this package uh, for when it needs to pull in new releases. All right. Um, and then if we, to wrap up the demo portion here, if we jump back over to the bundling server, um, this is just a, is that a, um, a Node.js web server. I'm using Fastify and then ES build at runtime. Um, 
And it has this slash SDKJS route that we are looking at that dynamically serves up the bundle. And then it's also got some static middleware for serving up the static files of the example. Um, this example I put together is definitely missing features. And just wanted to show that, and it kind of leads to the, the rest of my talk. Um, here, as we look at this code snippet, we can see we're, we're, um, we have an async function that's dynamically doing a build. And it's saying, hey, here's my entry point from the node modules folder, and here's some configuration. Um, ES build is incredibly fast, but it's still a CPU intensive operation that could also fail. Uh, so the part of where it could fail is line 23 here. What happens if, if the build just doesn't work? How do we provide something back to the end user, or do we just consider this kind of an epic fail and return a 503 status code. So um, we plan for happy paths uh, here where we are able to successfully build, but we also have to think about unhappy paths where, where maybe we're the node server is too busy and it can't build, or we just don't have anything uh, to serve them up. And I did not implement all of these unhappy paths uh, in my demo. But I do have some slides here that I want to share that, that dives into them. All right, so jumping back over to my PowerPoint. So as we, we talked about, uh, doing a dynamic uh, build of a bundle is a CPU intensive operation. So we want to avoid it at all costs. It's kind of funny. We want to do dynamic bundling at runtime, but we want it to be a last resort. We want to have many layers of cache in front of it first. Mm -hmm. So uh, even before jumping into the, the cache design, one cool thing we can do since uh, query string parameters are what um, define uh, the uniqueness about a build. So every permutation of these query parameters, we could technically go and predict ahead of time and kick off uh, those builds when the node servers are starting up or maybe when they're not busy. Um, for our JS SDK, there are millions of these permutations, so we can't do it for everything. But with this trivial example, I could have done every uh, possible query string combination and just built those all up front and put them in an in-memory cache and then serve those up when those query string uh, requests come in. The like I said, we want to avoid doing these builds at all costs. So we, we definitely want to leverage cache at multiple layers. Think of you know, caching as an onion. So in an ideal world, our bundle would be served up by edge cache. And that's Akamai or Fastly or any of these other um, edge providers. The benefit there is they have web servers all around the world. And uh, the buyer or user is you know, most likely to hit a server that's closest to them geographically. And uh, the closer that web server is, the faster their uh, time to first byte is going to be. So ideally, we want it served from edge cache. If, the, um, if it's not found in edge cache, we, we want that request to come back to origin. But we also want to check our in-memory cache first to see if we've already built that bundle. If so, it's going to be much faster to just grab that um, that JavaScript text response out of an in-memory cache and serve it up instead of doing a Webpack build. And that cache, like I said, can be populated from previous requests for that um, unique query string or by that pre-build operation. And if that request comes in and it's not found in our in-memory cache, then we are left with the decision of, do we do a dynamic build with what they've requested? And yes, we try that. And hopefully, it, it builds fast enough and we can respond with it. And if it does not build fast enough, then we need to kind of decide, do we serve up something so they get some type of basic um, UI components back with their SDK requests? Or do we throw a hard error letting them know, hey, we couldn't provide you with the, um, the specific SDK customization that you need. And depending on the use case, we do one or the other. Uh, but we're constantly looking at how we can optimize our cache uh, for this scenario. And finally, you know, working on a large JavaScript SDK, we want to support lots of contributors for that SDK and make it easy for them to safely deploy code. So 
uh, with my demo, it had the problem of if you wanted to deploy new client side code, you'd have to actually update your package.json in the node server and, and redeploy your node server. Uh, we have uh, tried to embrace deploying code to production as quick as possible and without having to restart all of our node servers. So we are able to do um, to have a watcher in our node uh, web server that's just constantly pinging a file, a config file to see, hey, is there a new version released? If so, let me go ahead and download it and queue it up for when the requester asks for it and I can serve it up when it's activated. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity to optimize a node app that's doing dynamic bundling. And really this demo is just, you know, just starting with the basics. Cool. So that is my talk. To wrap it up here, we've talked about that it's possible to use tools like Webpack and ESBuild and Rollup um, at runtime. It is our secret sauce here at PayPal to how quickly we can render uh, buttons and other components with our JS SDK. Um, you know, with this responsibility uh, comes a lot of complexity. So make sure you think this through if you're deciding on your SDK architecture. And the last note, the Web Audio API is awesome. It has nothing to do with uh, JavaScript bundling, but it's a really cool JavaScript feature in the browser, and I encourage you to check it out. And that's it. Thanks, everybody. All right, that was awesome, Greg. I loved the demo and the music. Um, and somebody made a meme, and I will share it after the Q&A sessions. But let's take Q&A. Um, there was a question here in the chat, which I think has been really popular, and I'll show it up here. It's by Arjun Sani, and he says, wouldn't the build time impact the page load time for the client? Yes, and uh, you know that's a great point. And really, the, uh, the reason why we need that uh, edge cache and in-memory cache architecture. So if you think about that HTTP request coming in for the SDK to the node server, um, if it is already found in the edge cache, it would never even hit the node origin server. So it'd be really fast. Um, if it does hit the node server, we'd read, we, you know, we'd ideally already have built the script and it would be in an in-memory cache where we could return that and it would be a fast uh, time to first byte. But then that final scenario of, oh, it's not found in any of the caches, we got to go ahead and kick off a build, that would lead to a delay for that first um, for that first buyer that's requesting the SDK where it's not found in cache. That makes sense. Um, Arjun, I hope that answered your question. But if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. I'll show the next question, which is by Amir. And he says, is it prototype pollution safe? Hmm. Um, Amir, are you able to uh, elaborate on that question? We'll come back to this in a minute. But let's take the next question, which is, how is the latency of the service? And Lalita asked this question. Yeah. Oh, great question. You know, with our PayPal JavaScript SDK used by millions of merchants around the world and even more buyers, uh, we have incredible speeds for uh, those high cash hit ratio requests. You know, the majority of the SDKs are served from cash, which um, has nearly, you know, as lowest latency as possible. And that's the how we've designed our Node.js web server uh, that's doing dynamic bundling is to try to leverage as much cache as possible to keep latency down. And with enough users, uh, and I uh, should have mentioned this point earlier, but with our SDK, our buyers share the same SDK script for that same merchant. So one buyer may have um, more latency at first, but then the cache is primed, and then the rest of the buyers for that time on the merchant website will get an instant SDK. Sweet. Um, Sarish also has a question, which is, how do you test edge caching? <laughs> uh, that, that makes me laugh uh, because, you know, edge providers like Akamai are commonly referred to as a black box. Um, they do have a, 
uh, a stage offering for their edge caching platform that we could leverage for testing. But it does kind of pose a bigger question of, should I use edge caching or not? And there's interesting results of companies like fly.io that have servers all around the world that say, hey, just run your application code on our servers. They're all around the world. They're going to you know, give you the same benefits of edge caching, except you get to control the code rather than it being some black box system uh, managed by Akamai or, or Fastly or any of the other kind of edge providers. That makes sense. Before you leave the stage, Greg, I want to share this meme that one of the attendees shared. Give me one second. And this was when you were playing the demo. Hi, Hat. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I loved it. Thank you so much, Greg. This was an awesome talk. I think it was really informative, and I definitely learned something. Um, everybody, make sure you got the code if you haven't seen the code, or if you missed the slide, you can always scrub back and get to the point where Greg has shared the code. If you have any questions for Greg, please share them in the comments here, and Greg will answer them whenever he can. Thank you so much, Greg. This was an awesome talk. Awesome. Thanks, Shruti. Bye, everybody. I want to invite our next speaker on the stage, Heymanth, and hold your horses. I'm going to introduce him. Heymanth is a fast philosopher, MTS at PayPal, Google developer expert for web and payments, DC39 delegate, DuckDuckGo community leader, member of Node.js Foundation, Google Launchpad Accelerator mentor. Welcome on the stage, Heymanth. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm really excited for your talk. I know you're going to be talking about like all the cool and upcoming things of uh, web, and you are a TC39 delegate, so I know this was this is going to be awesome. Your audio is not coming through, Hamant. OK, meanwhile, I'll share some tech, sh uh, tech memes that you guys have been sharing with me. Um, and if you want to share um, dev jokes that I can share on the screen, please do so. All right, I'm a full stack developer. I just pull things off the internet and put it into my code. Anybody watch IT Crowd? GraphQL 200, everything is good. All right, I see that Hamant is back. I'm going to add Hamant back on the stage. Welcome back, Hamant. Let's see if we can hear you. Is it OK now? Yes. Cool. Can you hear All me? right, Heyman. Yes. Can you uh, hear me? I'm not able to hear you. <sighs> I am on Chrome, Chrome Canary. I thought that's I had some experimental flags enabled on this. Maybe that's causing an issue. So I switched to the normal build of Chrome. Um, StreamYard says that my input output is fine. Can you try talking, Shruti? I can hear you, Hemant. Yeah, I can hear you too. OK, very good. Sweet. OK, over to you, Hemant. OK, awesome. I am sharing my screen. All right. I hope you can see the screen now, right? All right, web can do that. Uh, that's me. Uh, uh, I'm a TC39 uh, delegate and uh, uh, GD for web and uh, payments. I'm an MTS at uh, PayPal. And you can hit me at Blue Month on Twitter. And I'm just going to start my timer uh, here. All right. Let's let's go back in time. June 11, 2017, 18 days before uh, shipping the first ever iPhone, uh, Steve Jobs talks about Web 2.0, Ajax, and how a platform 
uh, can help you to securely distribute and rapidly develop applications uh, within a sandbox environment. And that is nothing but the browser. So he envisioned how a browser can be used to pack and ship uh, web applications. We all know what happened later. There was App Store. And we know how the money started flowing with App Store. And different companies started emulating uh, similar behavior of having App Stores. And a lot many startups went app only. They did have a website URL. Like You went to their URL and it said, hey, go ahead and install our app to get our experience. And some of them learned that was a mistake after a while. But here are these two gentlemen uh, from Google, Alex and Francis, uh, an excellent engineer and a designer. And along with their friends from Microsoft and Intel, uh, came up with this wonderful concept called PWA. As we know today, PWA is progressive web app, uh, web app which progresses itself uh, to native look and feel like app, which helps you to install, engage, have some kind of a background uh, on offline capabilities, has a splash screen and all of that. And then we know how PWA was a success story for many companies, maybe in terms of conversion, consumption, or increased revenue. One such example is Starbucks. Um, I'm sure if you have also used Spotify and likes, and there are many. Yes, and that's it. That's all we have for this talk. Well, not really. Welcome to Jurassic Park. Fasten your seat belts as we go through this park and see a lot of webosauruses. And I hope none of us get uh, eaten up by these monsters. I'm sure you'd have seen this uh, kind of a file. Uh, it's a manifest JSON if you have worked with Progressive Web App, which kind of says, hey, these are the attributes of my uh, Progressive Web App and how should it behave? And there are many attributes of uh, this manifest JSON. And one such interesting and a new attribute is run on startup. This attribute helps you to make sure that your progressive web app runs whenever your device starts. It can be any use, any use case, like say you're running something in the background, probably you want an alert user on uh, some cryptocurrency uh, going uh, fluctuating up or down, or you want to show a weather, or something that needs to run in the background but needs to start as the device starts. And that's possible today. Your progressive web app can run on startup. And you, you, you bet definitely you need to go through the navigator permissions and query for run on login and ask the user's permission for the first time. And then uh, once the permission is provided by the user, the application would run on startup every time the devices uh, you know, restart. That's a very interesting feature. And uh, we have uh, run on startup on manifest JSON. I'm sure most of you would have seen uh, add to home screen kind of a behavior when you're uh, uh, you know, navigating through the web and come across a progressive web app. But do you know that you have three different variants of having the uh, add to home screen? It can be that mini app bar that shows uh, in, uh, on your device. Or if you have already installed, it kind of shows, hey, uh, you've already installed this. You could launch it from here. Or also, you could have a full blown add to home screen with uh, a prompt showing all the uh, you know, icon and the short and long name of your application. This is also possible on uh, your desktop uh, web browsers, uh, where it says, hey, go and install this application. And you can also launch uh, the application if you have already installed. Say you hit an URL, you go and install. And the next time when you hit an URL, it says, hey, you can launch it because you have already installed it as a PWA on your desktop. The interesting event that I need to talk today about is uh, before install prompt. I think most of you would be aware of it, but I wanted to highlight this. Uh, this event helps you to uh, now defer the uh, prompt of showing the uh, install uh, banner, and you can take control on what the user does. Uh, here's an example. Say you have a button. Uh, when the user clicks on it, then you could want to show the prompt to the user saying that, hey, go and install this. Or you would probably show an arrow mark saying that install our app here, and the user go and click that button, and then you could uh, show the prompt, and then uh, the user would take a choice on it, and uh, you could uh, decide what the user did with that. But interestingly, uh, most of us would be interested to collect some kind of analytics on what's happening with the application or after the application is installed. And that's, that's when the app install uh, event helps. And this can help you to uh, capture any analy analytics events that you want to capture for your app. Uh, if you have been using progressive web apps and adding them to your home screen, you would have probably seen that there's this transparent uh, icon that uh, appears for PWS. Uh, one such proposal that was posted was to have maskable icons that cover the entire circle instead of having a transparent icon. And that was all uh, open in GitHub. These were the issues that were created. And today, uh, it's possible to uh, have uh, maskable icons uh, rather than having these transparent icons. 
The other interesting uh, idea that I would like to talk about is uh, badging uh, for app icons. Uh, most of the native app developers uh, I have conversed with would say that, hey, I with my native app, I can show a count on how many notifications that the user has not addressed, or I could keep incrementing it dynamically to give one subtle um, you know, uh, indication to the user saying that, hey, you have some notifications that you need to look into. And that's possible today with Web2, and that's uh, why the badging API, and it's as easy as this. You could just say navigator dot set app badge and give the count and it just sets and it's a beautiful promise based api and you could also clear the badge using navigator.clear app badge and it just like clears the uh, notification so based on your use case you have total control on showing that um, app badges uh, for your app applications and i'm sure you would have uh, come across uh, push uh, notifications where the user is asked to a prompt and they are allow saying that hey you could do uh, you could send push notifications for me and then after the permission is granted uh, we get the push notification as and when uh, the application uh, needs to send a notification no big deal but it gets interesting when you could reply in line uh, on a web application for a push notification and that's as simple as this within your service worker you just go ahead and say service worker show notification this is my notification and my body is this and my action is this so in your action you can have a like or dislike you can have a reply or or also you might uh, like to have, have some images to your notification and likes so that's that's very much possible today and let me uh, let me show you the small demo uh, of how you could kind of schedule the notifications and uh, trigger it and here's an example let's let's schedule it for uh, 2 seconds and uh, you can list all the notifications that's been scheduled here. And uh, because I think I've turned off my do not disturb, we are not seeing it. Let me schedule it again. And we see it here at the corner. And it says, hey, triggered notification from notification trigger glitch me, scheduled at such a time. So this, this kind of opens up gateway for uh, many other use cases where you want to schedule your notification or based on something that happened in the background or, or there was a push notification that came in but you need to wait for such a certain amount of time to show a particular uh, message to the user you can schedule your notifications using again uh, with the magic of service workers uh, you could get the get the registration and then say show notification uh, title tag you can tag them with uh, whatever tag is appropriate for your use case and then say uh, show trigger here here's where you say, you say that new timestamp trigger and then pass in the timestamp in milliseconds and that's when the uh, trigger would happen uh, that's a very cool uh, feature to have and i'm sure uh, you would have also experienced some kind of a background sync uh, during your uh, play with uh, web urls or progressive web apps here's an example of emojoy where jake and paul from google are talking about uh, their emotions using only emo uh, emojis and here on the left, we see we went on the airplane mode that we are, we are totally offline. And then we send some cat smileys. And we go ahead and kill the application entirely. So the application is completely dead. And on the right side uh, is the desktop application, uh, which is online. And then we on the left, we go online. And on the right, we get the cat emojis that were sent from the mobile device when we were on the airplane mode. So once the uh, device came online, we saw that hey, the notifications have been passed through. This is how background sync work, and which has been here for a while. But we now have something called a periodic sync. So we could do something very much similar to a background sync. And here's a snapshot from the DevTools where it's showing hey, you could also go and emulate a periodic sync. Uh, here we are doing a periodic sync of get cat uh, just to get the cat images. So you could periodically do such kind of a background sync and keep fetching uh, the data. Uh, without interfering uh, on what the user is interacting with. Here's an example of uh, image of the day. Uh, this is one of the uh, PRs I worked for uh, a sample uh, PWA um, as, as the, the Fugu project was working on. And uh, uh, this is also very simple. You could just do a registration of periodic sync uh, using uh, get, get, get the registration and then say registration.periodicsync.register and give it a name and then give it a minimal interval. Here, the interval is every day. So this application was fetching uh, images from NASA every day and putting it in the background for that application. So how cool is that, that now you could do, not only just do like background sync, but do a periodic background sync. And here's another example of uh, the, the background fetch. Um, uh, here are the screenshots from, uh, from an application which uh, downloads uh, you know, the videos. Uh, think of it like an, any other application where you're streaming some video or you have recorded some video and you want to download for offline access 
And you can do this today with having a background fetch. So you could download multiple uh, videos and just everything is happening in the background. You could still go ahead and uh, come out of the application, keep doing your other browsing stuff. And once the download is completed, you can send a notification. And that's that's possible uh, using a background fetch. So you could just uh, use your service worker again and then say uh, background fetch dot fetch, uh, give it a name and give all the uh, artifacts that you, you want to fetch in the background. And you could give it a title and uh, give the icon and also the uh, download total on the size and how much the background fetch is uh, fetching. And using this, you could show the progress bar saying that, hey, this much of uh, data has been downloaded and this much is left. And so you have uh, total control on uh, fetching uh, entities in the background. That's uh, possible with background fetch. And when background fetch fails or uh, succeeds, you have uh, listeners, of course, which says background fetch success and background fetch fail, uh, which helps you to you know, take care of um, required actions. In, in case of success, you need to probably um, use a broadcast channel and say, hey, this is, this is all succeeded. Now you have store it and put it in the cache. Or something failed and you want to want to notify the user that hey we were not able to uh, fetch uh, the resource you requested for and you have total control over the network again the other interesting aspect that i want to talk here is uh, most of the native application that you have been using would have uh, this share feature and with this share feature you could um, you would have uh, you for example you want to share an image on twitter or share it on any other social media you would hit the share button and it would list out all the applications to which you can share. And today, it's possible for a web application to receive that share as, as a share target. So what do you mean by share target is, say, you have an uh, PWA and you want to you hit the share button. And, and say you have another PWA, which kind of, kind of receives this uh, information and can process the uh, shared information. So that's the share target. Here's an example uh, of a manifest where you say my sh share target has an action of share.html and params that I'm passing to it is name, description, and link. And your share HTML is just like another HTML uh, where it can uh, work on load and pick up whatever it wants from the URL. In this case, it says, I hey, pass the URL and get the name description and the link from the URL from the params on this is the share.html. So whenever the user hits the share.html, it can receive it goes to share.html. Now you have the name description and link and you can do whatever you want with that. Isn't that interesting? Uh, in 2017, uh, I had posted this in one of the uh, you know, open committees where they were discussing about uh, the potential features for web. And uh, the idea over here was to have app shortcuts or actions. So when you do a long press on native apps, uh, normally you get these app shortcuts to take quick actions, right? So something like this is possible today, uh, where you have shortcuts. You could say name, description, give it a URL, give some icons, and uh, you could say what, you can give multiple such shortcuts. And uh, once the user uh, does a long press, here's an example on, on the Twitter PWA, you do a long press, you get a new tweet, explore, notification, or, or direct messages, right? So that's how uh, cool uh, it is uh, to have such things happen on web. Uh, all, all Everything is open and uh, in the wild, and uh, people are discussing about new ideas, and they're open for uh, contributions. And there are a lot many people with uh, ideas, just a GitHub issue, and sometimes a tweet can also end up being a feature uh, in web. And here's an example of uh, OTP. Uh, OTP is one-time password, and most of the uh, applications today uh, in different parts of the world rely on this uh, message where an, an application sends an uh, unique code uh, for that session, and that's yet, that gets used uh, to, say, authenticate or say that, hey, uh, I need to do a certain transaction. And um, uh, within this particular period of time, this is the key you need to use to do the transaction. And today, you are, it's possible for you to access that OTP uh, using web APIs. And that's, that's as easy as saying that navigator.credentials uh, and get, say, OTP as the parameter and uh, pass in an abort signal. This is to uh, abort, this is basically an abort controller, which says within this timeout, if I don't get the SMS, then hey, invalidate this. And you could say my transport is SMS. And, uh, and you get uh, the, the content is basically the SMS that you receive. And it's very easy for you to test whether uh, this feature is available or not uh, within your um, 
browser you could just say if not navigator.sms you say the feature is not available if it's available you can say you can await on this uh, promise function saying that navigator.sms.receive uh, and whatever you get uh, is the content that you receive from sms and you could think of lot many uh, possibilities here where you are using sms uh, not just for otp uh, based uh, trans like as i mentioned for transactions and like it could also be like login where some of the uh, startups i have seen have uh, gone out of uh, email and they are just using phone numbers uh, for uh, the credentials and uh, login, which is powered by OTPs. So there are many such use cases where uh, it's very useful. Uh, here's another example uh, I need to talk about is uh, the contact picker API, where it helps you to pick contacts uh, uh, you know, from your web app, which is basically using the uh, inherent native uh, contact picker and uh, you know, pulling information that you requested for. In this example, we are saying, hey, fetch me name, email, telephone, address, and icon. And you, you say multiple true. That means I can select multiple co contacts on the contact list. And you could say navigator.contact.select, give the props and ops, and finally you get all the contacts. But the key thing here is uh, the contact picker will only work on, on context. By context, I mean if there's a button and you click on that, that's when you can trigger a contact picker. So you can't just go in the background and fetch all the contacts without the user permission, right? So even if the user has given the permission to you, this prompt will only appear when the user takes an action on uh, some button or any call to action. So without the user's action, um, the, the contact picker wouldn't appear on the screen. The, the other interesting uh, API here I also talked about is the file access. So uh, this was uh, a dream for web developers uh, years ago that, hey, if I were to have access to the file system of uh, the you know, operating system, then I could do wonders. I could write an editor online and store a huge amount of data, or I could do video processing, I could do audio processing and likes. And today it's possible uh, you could access the file system. Uh, of course, when the user is uh, asked that, hey, this application is trying to access your file system and which part of the file system would you like to uh, you know, provide access to? The web application can take control over it. And this is also on call to action. So if on the button open on file, you could say, hey, choose the file system entries. You get a file handler. On that file handler, you can get a file. And you could do a text or to get the contents. As well as if you want to write, you again get a file handler and create a writable on it and write the content to it. So this is a wonderful uh, feature, uh, which makes uh, web more stronger and uh, more capable of handling a huge amount of data and not only storing it, also processing it and uh, likes. The, the, the API I want to talk about next is uh, get install related apps. Uh, this is an API that helps the progressive web app to know, hey, if, if I have a related application uh, or a counterpart for this progressive web app, I have a native application. Now I have to know whether they have installed this native application or not from my uh, progressive web app. I could use uh, get related uh, get install related apps. Uh, so basically, in the manifest, you would say related apps is of platform play and ID is com. Uh, in this example, it's com.android.chrome. So it would say whether um, that's installed or not. And you 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 can know where so the progressive web app can know uh, what are the related apps that's installed uh, for this particular um, progressive app, for this particular genre. Right. right. Uh, the other uh, interesting API that I'm talking about is uh, the screen way clock. Uh, this API is very much useful if you're a game developer where you know that you want to keep the screen in the caffeinated mode, then just don't go and lock it when I'm using this application. So that's that's possible uh, using a navigator dot way clock. You request for the screen and it gives you uh, control on uh, when the screen should be released and when it should be locked. So basically you await on the request way clock and uh, when the wake clock is released, in this case, we are just setting a timeout and releasing it. And that callback is called and released. So the, the screen, screen wake will be released. So you have control on uh, also locking the screen, uh, of course, when once the user uh, gives the permission for this. The, the, the other interesting uh, uh, API here is the WebSocket stream. Let me quickly open up the demo. Uh, the WebSocket stream, basically, uh, if you have worked with WebSockets in general, you would have probably uh, come across the uh, issue of back pressure. So when you're trying to read and write uh, within the uh, web socket, you would have some kind of a back pressure that's happening. Here's an example uh, where there is back pressure at the top and the below is the web socket stream. You see how web socket stream is processing it in higher and a faster speed. Uh, rather when without the uh, web socket stream, you have a back pressure. So you see how the, the, the data that is processing and being displayed, there's a delay. There's a very visible amount of delay happening, whereas the socket stream is like super fast and, 
amazing, right? So that that's possible with the uh, the socket stream today, and you could uh, you know open a read or write a uh, web socket stream and operate on it um, with closed just all the promise based operations. So you when you do a reader dot read, you would get a value undone, and once it's done, it's like it has processed all the uh, stream data. NFCs is one such cool feature. Here's a demo from one of the uh, Chrome, um, you know, Dev Summits I had visited, where the uh, phone is kind of reading each of those cards and uh, each of the color in those card and trying to get an emoji for that uh, particular color that's been mapped. So you can use NFCs uh, from web. You could use an uh, ND uh, EF reader for that, and you could do a scan. So it will basically use your NFC reader and do a scan. And you could also use a writer if you have those NFC chips to which you want to write. Uh, you could use this. Uh, you could use a ND uh, EF writer and uh, go ahead and write uh, something to the um, uh, NFC uh, chip, whatever you have. So we used to have those uh, small tapes with uh, NFC tags in it, and you could we would you would write your uh, uh, you know website URL, and people could scan with uh, your NFC reader, and they would uh, it would automatically open the browser uh, to that URL, and which was a cool thing to show off. Uh, here's another example uh, where web is today capable of talking to USB as well. And in this uh, particular uh, demo, uh, we are talking to the uh, the microcontroller, which has an uh, OLED display. And from the web, we are sending a message saying hello, and that appears on the microcontroller. And uh, same thing, you could say, and how are you, and then say uh, bye, basically. And all of those messages from um, the browser is going to your USB device, and it's being displayed there. How is that possible? That's as easy as saying navigator.usb. Get USB. Get the devices. So it would it would be a promise API which says, hey, I have these many devices that are connected to the USB, and uh, here are all of these devices, and uh, here's the information, uh, the serial numbers, and you get you get the information uh, from that device. And also you can filter on a particular uh, device if you already know the vendor ID, the product ID. You could say, hey. Uh, request devices with this filter, and I want only to access uh, this image. So I got a list of devices, but out of this the, this list list of devices, I want to access a particular device or a set of devices with this filter. You could do a request device on this filter, and it would give you only that devices, and you could start operating on them. Same thing is possible uh, for you for uh, to work on Bluetooth. Uh, here's an example where it's talking to the Polar H7 and taking uh, doing a breath analysis or getting your heartbeat and. All of that, and that's that's possible with web. As simple as that, you could just say navigator.bluetooth and request a device uh, with the filter. And in this case, we are saying uh, you were using battery service for that particular device, and you can say get connect, and basically you would be able to get the uh, you know battery information uh, for this Bluetooth device. So you could work on different services that the this Bluetooth device is capable of, and you could get that information. How cool is that? Uh, the other uh, API that we are seeing here is the context indexing API. Uh, say you have, uh, as we saw in the other examples, where you could download a lot of data in the background, and say your application today has a lot of information that's been uh, downloaded for offline access. With context uh, indexing API, you could index them based on a particular tag or an information. It is not really a search; it's meant for indexing. So you can say registration dot index dot add and give it an index ID and say these are the URLs or title and description. Give it icons and categories. So you can categorize each of your downloads and it helps you to index and surface of the data quickly. And, and that's that's a very useful API if your application is um, mostly focused on uh, offline uh, data access and download and likes. Here's another example of what is it capable of. And uh, in a couple of lines, uh, you could go ahead and uh, use your camera from the mobile device, from your mobile web, or you, even if it's desktop, it doesn't matter. You could access the camera and scan the uh, barcode and, and get the value of that barcode in, in uh, like the raw value. You can see here, it's just says, just a plain old text or uh, someone's email ID and likes, right? So that's possible with just a couple of lines of code. You can use the new barcode detector and detect and pass it an image, and then you could decode the barcode and give you the raw values. Similar thing with face uh, recognition. You can uh, recognize the faces uh, given an image. Uh, here's Sir Gabriel in front. It's an old uh, Google image with uh, the initial Google employees here. So you could use a face detector API and then say, hey, new face detector, uh, detect this image and uh, give me all the uh, raw values for the faces that were detected. And then you could draw a boundary. Uh, the other uh, API that I would like to talk about is uh, the, the payment API. Uh, this is an uh, API uh, which could be a token itself. And 
is a talk I had previously delivered on and uh, here's an uh, example on how what is the payment api capable of today you could it can integrate with paypal as well and you could do law you could do web payments uh, within uh, the browser and it would show a pop-up with all your saved cards you can use that or and like so it gives you all the capabilities of doing payments within the web uh, and this is uh, a cheeky feature that i just plugged it in uh, here uh, which is uh, kind of uh, people on the developers are interested in having the dark mode for their application or light mode and with uh, this is more like a css uh, addition with a media query you could say preferred color is light or dark and based on whatever css you are providing uh, it changes the theme uh, as simple as that and today web and pw can be uh, packed to be found on the uh, play store uh, here are a few apps that help you to build such and pack your uh, pw into an apk and in 2018, I had made some predictions that, hey, we would be probably seeing NFC ambient lane context or SMS and, and likes. And most of it is true. And I'm really happy to see that. And we still have tons of feature uh, coming to web. And Project Foo is one such interesting project if you're interested in contributing with potential features. I'm definitely happy to see you there. Yeah, is that end of the list? Um, well, uh, this is the treasure slide. Uh, please take a snapshot or uh, make a note of this. It's Hemant HM6130. It's not really the end of the list. You can go to this uh, URL, awesome PWA, which I've been collecting for a few many years now, where we have awesome PWAs uh, which all with awesome web capabilities, all the capabilities that I kind of uh, talked you through, walked you through. Uh, you could go ahead and see the demo applications there, and uh, you know, I try to understand them more better. And that's me. You can hit me on hdman.com. And thank you. Wow, that was a power packed talk, Hemant. I loved it so much. Thank you. Um, my favorite part was the heartbeat thing. That was so cool. I had no idea you can do that. Yes. OK, I have some questions for you. And in the chat, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to comment as well. I want to ask on behalf of everybody else who wants to contribute to the web, how can people contribute to the web? I know you contribute a lot, and you're an open source contributor. How can other people contribute to the web as well? Yeah, so, uh, so there are many avenues. Uh, so what do you uh, like mean by contribution, right? It can be many ways. Uh, some of them like to talk about uh, wha how, what is the web capable of. They could probably do demo about latest technologies. Or some of them want to get into the spec development process. And some of them want to contribute to free and open source projects. So there are many avenues to start with. But you need to uh, get your focus on where you want to be. Suppose you want to say, contribute uh, features or potential proposal to uh, JavaScript, then TC39 is the community that you need to look into. Or what WG is the community that you want to look into if you want to get into spec of webs particularly. So there are many avenues. Uh, so you need to get your thoughts clear on where and which. And uh, we have to do a lot of reading because most of the ideas that we think would have probably already been proposed or would have been rejected for valid reasons. So we have to do some uh, analysis and uh, try to decide where we want to contribute. And uh, we could talk more about, I can pass you more links and blog articles and likes. Sweet, that makes sense. Um, Krishna has asked a question here, which is, can PWAs have App Store presence? And he has a follow-up question, which is, can PWA access the device hardware features such as cameras? Yeah. Uh, good questions. Uh, I, I thought that was the most fundamental thing of uh, there is this get uh, user media API that helps you to access uh, the camera and the mic, as we saw in few of the demos where we are using, uh, where we are trying to scan the barcode, right? Uh, that was using the camera, that was using the get user media. That would work only on uh, secure sites, so it should be on HTTPS, and that works. And yes, you can pack uh, PWS to Play Store. Uh, as I, in the slides, I pointed out to a few of the uh, such tools which help you to package your um, progressive web app into an APK and then ship it to uh, the Play Store. And in today, today we have a few uh, PWS on Play Store already, uh, which is uh, PWS. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shaman. This was a power pack talk. I love the talk. There were so many new features that I discovered. Where can people find you if they have questions? Uh, Twitter is the best at Numanth is me, G N U M A N T H. Sweet. Thank you so much, Haven. Awesome. See ya. 
All right, I want to invite our next speaker, Arvind Naidu. Arvind Naidu is an idea guy, full stack, full stack JavaScript engineers, and he's been working with PayPal for seven years. Today, he's going to have a 15-minute lightning talk, and he's going to talk about how to build a send money app in less than 15 minutes. And he'll be using real money, and this will be in production. Welcome to the stage, Arvind. Um, I'm hoping you can see my screen. This is going to be awesome. I actually took a shower for this, so it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> trust me. Um, so uh, this talk about this talk is about how we're going to build a send money app in less than 15 minutes. And um, the outline is basically which I'm going to give you some disclaimers, and then I'm going to give you an intro to the environment in which we're going to build this uh, called uh, mini apps. And then I'll get on to I mean, coding the app out. OK, so that's the idea. Uh, first thing, first bummer is, is the fact that it's just for PayPal employees, so others can watch but can't play yet. Um, so I can see a lot of this. I can imagine a lot of disappointment. Uh, so the title should have been How to Build a Send Money App in Less Than 15 Minutes for PayPal Employees. But I kind of clickbaited you guys. Um, next up. It'll only work on iOS devices. It will not make you any money. So the slide should have actually been how to build a send money app in less than 15 minutes for PayPal employees and iPhones and are in it for the glory and not for money. I think everybody would have lost interest by now, except Zach. Zach is probably still there. So the slide should have been for Zach. Do check this out. It's really cool. What are we going to make? We're going to make an app called Sender. Um, it'll have an input box. You're going to enter an email of your buddy, and then you push a button, and it's going to send a dollar, right? Real money. And uh, what do we need to make this? We're going to use this uh, awesome tool called uh, PayPal Mini Apps, uh, which which hosts the code that you write, and it's built on React Native. Cool. Um, so let me get started with what. PayPal Mini is a little bit, because that's the one that's going to host the app that we're going to build. Um, it's an app that, that employees download from our internal app store. It's a high-speed prototyping and app sharing environment for people. It's built on React Native. And um, it's kind of like Expo. Uh, React Native's Expo had a baby with PayPal app. Some say the baby is ugly, but we'll just go ahead and see how it is. I'll switch to the demo. Here we go, PayPal Mini. Let me just get started with PayPal Mini. I'll give you a little intro. Like I said, it's an app. Um, it's right alongside with my regular business, PayPal business app and PayPal for consumer app. Uh, it's got this little purple icon. I don't have too much money right now. It's $2.50. And uh, so this is the landing page for the app. It's it's pointing to live. There's a QR code on QR code scanner on top and an app store at the bottom. When you tap on the app store, it shows all the modules, all the cool React Native bundles that other employees have built. One is a group send, which lets you send money at bulk, uh, which is a feature that is not there in the native app right now. Um, and there are other cool ideas that people come up with, mostly me, but uh, I hope it's just for now. And you can tap on and install it, just like you would install any other app on the App Store. Cool. And um, so it installs on your home screen like this. And you tap on it, it gives you a little warning saying, dude, you do know what you're doing. You're dealing with real money. It's it's very close to injecting JavaScript into a browser, right? You open up the console window, you toss some JavaScript in, everything works. Same way, um, what this does is it lets you extend the PayPal app um, in any way possible, right? So here's a, here's a screenshot. I selected two people. I can send both of them money, right? Um, so yeah. Let's now, so now that you know what PayPal um, Mini is, it's it's a parent app that can pull in dynamic JavaScript that you build, and it can run it for you in the context of your PayPal Live account. Cool. OK, let me go ahead. OK, now let's start building the app anytime now. All right. Remember the app that we were talking about, an app that has a text box, and you're going to um, 
use, use it to send money. So I created a sender directory, a CD to sender. And then um, I have a little tool called mini. It creates a docker.yml file for me. And then there, uh, a, a docker compose file for me. And I say docker compose up dash D, which runs it in demo mode. So the entire development environment for this is going to be is, is dockerized, which means you don't have to do any NPM installs or pod installs or any of that craziness. Everything comes prepackaged. And we're done. We're, set, we're done with the setup of development environment. There you go. It um, that's my Docker uh, desktop. It has three containers running. Let's launch the admin, and uh, the admin has a QR code. We wonder what that does. Let's go to the uh, PayPal Mini app. So I'm tapping on the scanner, the QR code scanner on top, and then you scan that, and the sender app is installed. So this sender app is basically just your uh, just your development environment, right? Which I'm going to show you in a little bit. Um, as you can see, it's very much similar to React Native's uh, Expo, and uh, and there's that authorization again, and uh, it downloads the JavaScript bundle uh, from your Docker instance, and there you go. You have a Send Money app, which is suspiciously close to what we were planning to build. Um, so let's open up the other code editor for for this. And uh, okay, so this is the this looks like um, the code that actually powers um, the, the mini app that you just saw. So let's go into the code. So there's the mini app um, main, main file over right there. And then there's a send money component. Um, and uh, if, you, if I were to show you the screen of the app on the right, so, so as soon as I comment that out, it live reloads. And uh, so as you code, you can basically just code on live if you want to. Or code on sandbox, you get to switch environments, right? So let's go into. I'm hoping uh, you guys are all following. Cool. So um, let's get into the code. I'm going to walk you the, through the code. I'm able. I'm, ho I'm also hoping that the font is big enough for you guys to see. Let's get going. There we go. Here's the send money app. Um, I'm going to just walk through the code here. It's a very simple 85 line uh, file. Uses React and there's an EC email validator. I use we use native base for UI components, and the PayPal context. This is where the magic happens. It's just a higher order component that wraps your entire mini app. It provides um, some really cool stuff like the fetch um, function, which will um, which already contains your credentials, uh, pointing to whatever environment you're you're at right now. So in this case, it'll be live. So if I, I can make calls to internal APIs using that fetch, and um, I just have to say use, uh, use context, PayPal context, and it takes care of everything. And if you're timed out, the fetch will automatically throw a login screen as well. right? And then there is the email field to capture the state of whatever you're typing. And uh, yeah, and then there's a make personal payment. I'll get back to that. Uh, there's a little send money heading. And uh, there's a form with uh, one input box. And then on change of the text, I'm setting the state to email. And then when you click the button, it's going to um, uh, make a personal payment right, to that email that you just entered. Now, and then it'll alert the payment ID that was just made. So very simple. There's a little send a dollar uh, text on the button itself. So let's get into the the meat of this. This is the one that's actually doing the work. The make personal payment function. It takes a recipient's email. And that's the payload that you have to put in. And uh, remember that fetch that we got from the context? We use that to hit an internal payment API. Believe it or not, that's the API that moves money in PayPal. And uh, there you go. It just prints uh, success if it uh, is able to make that peer-to-peer -peer transaction. Um, OK, let's give it a run. I'm typing my wife's uh, email address there. I had to redact uh, parts of it. There we go, yahoo.com. I send a dollar. And uh, it should alert the payment. Already. There you go. So that that's, we just built a fully functional send $1 app pointing to live. Okay, let me get into the 
details of um, this. The first thing when I show this to people, they go like React Native. Come on, it's not that uh, performant. Um, it's not as good as native. And the debate is going to go on. Well, I'm, I, I myself like native development um, better for certain, for a lot of use cases. But then the the, quest, the answer to that is like, well, can you build a send money app in less than 15 minutes uh, without even a Mac? That's a question. So this is a matter of speed, quick prototyping. And I think for internal tools, React Native is very powerful. And uh, just to pique your curiosity and build new functionality, right? And um, just on the last leg of this presentation, I would like to talk about some of the uh, my favorite apps out in the App Store that if I could personalize it, I could hack into it, and I could use it my way, I would first start with uh, Uber. Uh, this is the landing page of Uber these days. And uh, imagine uh, you're, you're out in the city drinking, eight drinks down. You open up this app. You have no idea what to do. Uh, for me, I would like something like this. 4 o'clock in the morning, it should automatically say go home. And it tells you how much it costs. If they were, if they had some um, like dynamic loading of bundles, I would definitely build this bundle and start using Uber that way. If I was an Uber employee, DoorDash, same problem. All I want is pizza. That's what I like. Uh, Zach wanted me to do Tinder as well, but I'm not gonna do that. And that's the end of the talk. That was awesome, Arvind. I have a question. Who is Zach? Zach said he he'll join, and uh, he's he's probably my only um, like confidant in PayPal. So <laughs> he, he volunteered to join right away. Yeah, cool sweet. Guy. That was a great. That was a great talk. I especially loved the the Uber idea. That was really cool. Um, I think it's true. Like if it's at one a.m., basically all you wanna probably most likely where you want to go is home. So it should just take you home with one click. I think that was super cool. We have a question from Shivan here. Uh, Shivan Kapoor says, Arvind, what will it take to make the stack open source and applicable to other companies and their developers? So Shivan is like the opposite of Zach, right? He's my enemy in PayPal. So let's get started. Shivan wanted want to ask him what, what would it take to make it applicable? First up, I want more people to use it. Within PayPal, it's still an alpha. A lot of people um, haven't been on the platform yet. I would like to see more. Uh, I would like for it to be stress tested. And at some point, I, I think it would just, we'd, we'd be able to pack it into a nice bundle and and, uh, and promote this, right? And and uh, this is one of the ways, uh, these conferences. Yeah, I, I'm not very good at that, so. <laughs> well, that was a great answer. But Arvid, if people have follow-up questions for you, where can they find you? I have it on the slide. It's uh, actually Buzz Arvin uh, on Twitter, B U Z Z A R V I N D. Cool. I'll make sure to tag you there. But thank you so much, Arvin. That was a great talk. And thank you for helping us know how to build Send Money app within PayPal only in 15 minutes. I think I did it in eight, but who cares? <laughs> Sweet. Thank you, Arvin. Thank you so much. All right. I want to invite our next speaker, Ankita Jain, on the stage. Ankita Jain is a full stack software engineer, part of the developer experience team at PayPal. And she is a JavaScript and front end technology enthusiast. Hey, Ankita. Hi. Ankita is going to talk me? about console. I can hear you OK. OK. Ankita is going to talk about console UI component library and shell with analytics integration. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with console, Console is a platform within PayPal for federated development and supports building internal tools. Ankita, feel free to share your screen. Great. OK. Uh, so hi, guys. Uh, I'm going to share some, uh, uh, some things about Console and how we've integrated analytics with each component on Console. So the agenda for today is to discuss why uh, analytics is important, especially for internal tools, and uh, what is the experience of integrating analytics today, uh, and how Console has em enabled uh, use the use of analytics uh, in the various extensions that are created through Console, 
and uh, how the extension providers uh, feel the uh, the data helps them in improving their product so let me get started with the uh, analytics and importance of analytics so analyt analytics is uh, the means through which you can discover interpret and communicate any meaningful pattern in your data so today in today's world all big and small companies basically instrument some part of their code to collect some meaningful uh, data uh, about how the customer engages with the platform so this data can be easily uh, made accessible to different people in the business uh, where you can create ad hoc reports and also identify errors that were previously unknown right like some client side errors which you would never have seen before uh, it can be used to streamline operational processes and also provide detailed insights anytime and anywhere. Thus, this data can be used to make important decisions for your business. Analytics can basically highlight the weaknesses and the strengths of your businesses and uh, basically improve the life cycle of your product. So at PayPal, uh, I'm from the customer, uh, the developer experience team. So all our developers at PayPal to push their pro, uh, product to uh, the the production co uh, code to production, they have to follow a secured product development life cycle. So during this uh, life cycle, the developer basically interacts with many internal applications. Just to uh, name a few, like Butterfly, GitHub, or CM Pass. These are a few applications that the developer has to interact every day to if they want to push a code to production. So now that we know how important analytics is, what if we integrated this to each of these internal apps that you see on your screen? Would that actually improve developers' experience? Yes, definitely. So if the developer experience improves, you automatically see an improvement in the developer's productivity. And the, finally, the developer gets time back to focus more on the end product that goes into uh, making what PayPal is. And obviously, the stock price rises, right? <laughs> so why are people hesitating to integrate analytics in the uh, internal products? Uh, one of the reason uh, could be to uh, one of the reason is the amount of effort it takes to integrate analytics today. So the first thing that you have to do is to understand the existing analytics platform that PayPal provides. Uh, most of the internal apps are uh, built on some technology which is not current or recent. Hence, to integrate the newly created analytics framework would be difficult. So the uh, internal team has to basically evaluate the feasibility of actually embed, uh, integrating analytics to their product. Next up would be to estimate the work required to set up tracking. Gather all the requirements from your teammates or your product managers on what re actually requires to be instrumented then actually uh, instrument the code and test the code to see if the analytics is set up correctly, not only in your local environment, but also in sandbox and production. A major hurdle at PayPal is to see the connectivity. So your analytics platform should be able to connect to the zone in which your internal tools are deployed. So this might be a major blocker and uh, you'll have to spend a lot of time here. Next. Once you have the setup ready, you'll need to verify if the flow of the data is correct. And also, there may be some gap while instrumenting the date, uh, the code. So you'll have to probably instrument some missing requirements as well. Now, after this long list, you have to actually uh, understand what the data means, right? You've collected, you've done all this work, and you've collected the data. But what's the use of the data if you can't really understand what the data means? So you'll have to kind of learn a visualization software to see what the data actually means and create different visualizations. And then finally, after doing all of this, you'll have to kind of make decisions on improving your platform uh, looking at the data. So my guess is that it would take at least two sprints of work for this, uh, doing this uh, for only one application. If you have 10 or more applications, then it would take more time, right? So What's the solution here? Isn't this frustrating? Why should we really uh, repeat this work all the time when a new internal app is created or even for the existing internal apps that don't have analytics? 
the solution is here. We are building console that has analytics embedded in it. And when you create an extension to console, you don't have to repeat this process at all. So now what is console? Console is a federated development platform that is used to create internal applications, which we call as extensions as well. Now, when you create an extension using the console CLI library, you just have to run console extension create. This will create three things for you. One is the web extension, which is a React-based application, a CLI extension, which is based on the open CLI framework, and third is an API spec where you will have to define all your uh, backend API dependencies. This is in the open API spec uh, format. So console provides an SDK which has two different components as well. The API client, which is uh, which provides a REST as well as a GraphQL client to communicate with your backend systems. And a, a UI library. Now this UI library has many different components that you can embed in your web pages or when you create an extension. The UI library is extended from Microsoft Fluent. And we also have added a few components that we feel are required from by different extension owners. So with this, uh, if you have 10 different internal apps, each app becomes an extension to console. Each app owns the extension, uh, develops it, and completes the development and pushes it to pr uh, production. So by that, uh, I mean it publishes the extension through the console gateway. And here in console CLI and console web uh, interface, you'll see all these extensions as homogeneous uh, and one uh, entity. And you won't feel the difference that these extensions are created by different teams. So uh, here is the opportunity. Where is the opportunity to integrate analytics here? So console have four different things. One is the web shell, the CLI, the UI library, and the API client. All these four things become uh, points where you can actually embed analytics. So let's get started with the web shell. So the web shell basically loads all the extensions that were created, and it knows how to route each extension. So if a user visits a page of an extension, it knows exactly how to basically uh, route that request to that particular extensions page. So when you send a beacon to the analytics platform, it knows the extension name, and it also knows the page URL. The uh, analytics script is embedded uh, into the console's web shell, and uh, that's how it also can calculate the amount of time each uh, page takes to load. So that is also uh, possible to embed in this. Next up, the console shell also performs SSO authentication on behalf of all the users, all the other extensions. So it knows the username as well. So that's also uh, part of the uh, beacon that we sent to analytics. Now, if the page fails to load, and if there is some JavaScript error, that error is captured by the web shell's uh, error boundary. So you can see that this can also be sent to the FPTI beacon. So in all, uh, this provides a very good, uh, uh, or this, this data is very good for the extension owners. So they know how much time their uh, pages uh, in, uh, in the extension are taking to load, and also the different kind of errors, right? So uh, after the data is collected, the console uh, team has uh, taken this up on themselves to create different dashboards with the data. Some of them you can see on the screen. The first one is the console errors. So each extension might have different errors that occur when the page loads. So this dashboard indicates the uh, extension with the highest number of errors. And also it provides a nice breakdown of the errors. Like, is it, a cons uh, is it the authentication error? Or is it uh, an error while the uh, API is being called? Or is it a JS error? So the extension owner really just has to log into the system. Uh, it's a Kibana dashboard. They just have to open the dashboard and view the data and make a decision. Nothing else is required from their end. Next up is the CLI. So CLI can track basically all the commands that it executes. So when a user, end user, uh, 
basically triggers a command like console extension create or console build they uh, the uh, cli has a base command which is uh, part of the every other command that is uh, created in console so this base command basically sends a beacon to the uh, tracking platform so this beacon consists of the actual command that's being triggered and also the details of the uh, from where the command is basically being triggered like the host the shell the cli version and the os if the command fails it also is smart enough to capture the error and send it to uh, the tracking platform so the extension uh, owners they don't have to really uh, ping the person who's ran the command to find out the error but they can just go to the kibana dashboard and see uh, the uh, actual error trace that's happened on the end user's uh, machine and that's how they can improve their uh, extension as well now the next part is the ui uh, library so console provides a extensive ui library which they've uh, basically uh, exported from the microsoft's fluent uh, ui library we've added certain components as well so the ui component uh, library has uh, many uh, areas where we've embedded analytics one is such uh, area is the uh, on click function so all the components that have an on click function we were able to uh, basically call the fpti uh, uh, beacon just before the on click function was triggered so in this way we can basically identify all uh, identify all the clicks that happened for one particular button and the unique thing here is that we can really identify which button it was uh, we can pass the tracking name as the text of the button or any id or name field that appears on a button the user can optionally pass a tracking name as well if they want to uniquely identify the button and the clicks that were made on that button another interesting thing that we send uh, is the ui component name so uh, this is really helpful for console to understand which ui components are highly used and we can basically uh, have uh, enhancements to those components and actually really track the behavior of the user using those uh, this data next up is a on change event uh, this is similar to the on click event so all the components that have an on change event uh, they are basically being tracked we send a beacon every time the uh, option of the drop down is changed so in this way you can really basically find out the value that was most selected and you can kind of alter your ui to if it's the most uh, used value you can kind of just remove it from the drop down make a real option for the users not to look through the drop down now the most interesting component that we've uh, actually uh, instrumented is the wizard component so this is uh, a component that's used across multiple different extension uh, it is used to collect step by step information from the user so it has step 1 details step 2 components and step 3 review and at, at the end you can basically submit this form so now this wizard component uh, is track uh, is basically instrumented to track exactly where the user left the wizard incomplete so there is this dashboard that indicates the number of form abandonments for a particular wizard and for a particular step in the wizard and this data uh, is completely free <laughs> you don't have to spend a minute to instrument anything in the wizard the second uh, chart here is to show the total amount spent on each wizard and the third uh, chart is to show the total amount spent but it's divided on, uh, across different steps as well so this is a really pretty cool uh, thing that we providing our extension owners uh, to basically investigate what went wrong where and improve the experience of the end user or the developer in our case and the last part uh, is the api client so the api client basically tracks all your api calls so in console all your api calls are made through one of the two api clients that uh, console sdk provides it's either a rest client or a graphql client so if these api calls are going through that client that client is already instrumented to collect uh, data about your api Uh, we collect actually the time it takes to uh, for the api to return a response so 
uh, in this chart you'll see that the average uh, this chart actually demonstrates the average latency for each api that you see here right now it's just dummy endpoints here but it basically shows for any extension how much time each api took uh, for that extension and if you really uh, see this is really powerful uh, because you, this information was never available for an internal tool right if your api is slow it's slow that's how the experience is but if you have this data you can really look at it and try to improve your api performance uh, secondly uh, this chart is to show the number of H, uh, calls that have the HTTP status 500, 404, and 403. So this also gives you an idea of how the API is performing and where is it where the calls are failing the most. So at a high level, the console web shell provides out of the box tracking. It provides unique visitors. It provides you with traffic patterns per state per country. And it provides you with the, the users that are frequently using your extensions so that you can reach out to them for feedback. Uh, there is also latency for each page load that we've calculated. And the, all this data is basically free of cost. You don't have to do anything. The CLI also basically tracks the, uh, each execution of each command, the user of the command, as well as the traffic pattern there. Similarly, the console API uh, client tracks the latency for each API and the error ca categorization for each API as well. Console UI components is the most unique one that I've found so far because we instrument many, most of the components that we have and the user just have to use the component as you would use normally without doing any uh, special thing for it. So let's revisit the list that we saw earlier, uh, to, which were uh, required to uh, instrument analytics. So here you see most of these things are taken care by the console platform. You don't have to uh, understand the analytics platform. It's already done for you. You don't have to basically instrument any of the code. You don't have to worry about the visualization software. You don't have to create any visualization. All of that is taken care for you and we've already created it for you. All you have to do is open the visualization and look at the data and make decisions to improve your platform, which will have a direct impact on PayPal and the uh, product that PayPal developers are building. So uh, all this takes not more than a few days, right? So you're not spending two sprints worth of time on this. That's uh, it from my side. Uh, it was a uh, good experience for me to talk about an internal product and how we've managed to add analytics. And I'm open to any questions for you, if you have. Thank you so much, Ankita. That was awesome. I love the console SDK. Their data is super detailed. I have a question. Um, is the data real time or is there a delay? Uh, no, so the data that we see in Kibana is real time. So there may be a delay of a couple of minutes, but that's acceptable, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then we have a question from Pranjal Jain, which is, is this open source? Uh, so not yet. This is pretty much very custom for PayPal requirements. The SSO and the analytics things are very custom for PayPal. But we, in future, we might have a plan to open source this because we have been approached by uh, external companies who are interested in building a platform like this. So you never know. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. And uh, Harsha has a question. From where does the Kibana dashboard read those logs, error logs? So interestingly, uh, when you load your page, you have some uh, JavaScript errors, right? So at that time, the console SDK itself picks up those errors and sends a beacon to uh, the tracking platform. So uh, the tracking platform is actually getting data from the console SDK itself. And Kibana basically shows that data uh, that the tracking platform is collecting from console. Got it. Really cool. Um, and Ankita, if people have any questions, where can they find you? Uh, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm available at AJ5990. That's my ID. Sweet. Thank you so much, Ankita. This was an awesome talk. Thank you. 
All right, folks, we're now into the section when we are getting into our break. But before we go into the break, of course, we have to do dev jokes. So I'm going to share my screen again. So now I have a question for you. What did JavaScript call his son? Put your answer down in the comment section. And I will give you 30 seconds. What did JavaScript call his son? Also, if you have dev jokes, or if you know any tech memes, or if you know any tech puns, share them on Twitter with us and tag us at JSPayPal2021, or tag our, uh, in our Twitter handle, PayPal Dev. OK, I got an answer from OK, OK, too fast, too fast. I got an answer from Good Bedford, Jason. That is correct, Good Bedford. You're right. It's Jason. You guys are so smart. Everybody knows this question. All right, next question. What did database engineer's baby call their father? What did database engineer's baby call their father? Meanwhile, you're answering this. I also want to highlight that you may have noticed that this is a new YouTube channel. We created this channel because we have so much great developer content that's coming out to you. We have we've got it lined up. And all of the talks that you're watching today will be recorded and shared on this uh, YouTube channel. So go ahead and click that Subscribe button and let us know which talk you're excited about most. All right, now I can see some answers coming in. Patrick Shaughnessy, Dara is right. Shoy Brain, I know you mentioned that too. So I'm going to show both of you. There was engineers baby called their father, Dara. All right, folks, let's get into the break. We're going to be back at 1.30 PM PST. Um, we're going into our lunch break. But if you've already had lunch, or if this is past your lunchtime, If you've already had lunch or this is past your lunch time, you can come and hang out with us in Gather Town in the game room. We're going to be playing some games there. Um, you can see I'm sitting in the keynote here, but I'm going to walk over to the game room now. Come and hang out in Gather Town. I'll see you at 1.30 PM.
Hello, everyone. What's up? I'm Titus here, and I'll be your MC for the afternoon at JS at PayPal. Uh, hope you all had a great lunch or a great break wherever you are in the world. And thanks again for tuning in. We've got a really great lineup of talks for the, re for the rest of the afternoon, and uh, I can't think of a better way to start things off um, than with Amy Egan's talk on smart payment buttons with front-end frameworks. Amy is a software engineer on the checkout integration team, and she is happily living in South Florida with her husband and tiny poodle. Hopefully we can see some pictures of the poodle later. And she's a big fan of outdoor activities and the beach. So please help me welcome Amy. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, all right, I've got to bring my slideshow in here. And there we go. Awesome. I'm here to talk about smart payment buttons in front end frameworks and how to add the pick all buttons to a modern web app. So, first off, what are smart payment buttons? Okay, these are fancy PayPal buttons. Um, if we remember from years and years ago, there used to just be the single PayPal button. Um, now we have awesome things like pay later, credit, we have a guest checkout option. Um, if you're on mobile, you might have the option of Venmo. In certain other countries, like in Europe, there's different payment methods, and we support those as well. So lots of configuration options. You can change the appearance. You can change which buttons show or stay hidden. Um, so yeah, lots of things that we can do with these. Uh, at the base level, how this works is you're going to import a script. If you saw Greg's talk earlier, um, you know a little bit more about how this works. I did a lot of cool things to give you just exactly this, the code that you need instead of a giant bundle. And then you're going to add a container that's going to hold your buttons. It lets you put them exactly where you want on the page. And then you're going to render those buttons into that container. But you might already be seeing a problem. If you use modern frameworks, basic HTML, vanilla JavaScript doesn't really fit in super well. So if you're using Angular, React, Vue, Svelte, whatever the newest, latest, greatest thing is, there's always more, um, we have a few different ways that you can add these PayPal buttons but have it feel more natural to that new app setup. So the first option, you can still include that script tag in your base HTML and then use a driver that we provide. And that will work with React, Angular, and Vue to bring in basically, you know, if you're using React, a React component, um, Angular, Vue. Um, the second option would be to use PayPal.js. Um, this one is my favorite. It's the only one that works with Svelte. Um, you can use it with basically any front end framework. Um, it works with React, Angular, Vue, Svelte anything else that might come up eventually. And then the final option is the best for React. It only works with React, but it also works the best for React. So it really depends on what you're using, but ultimately, these all work the same. There's some limitations, like that spelled limitation. But otherwise, they all kind of do the same thing. Whether you're using a script tag or you're importing it from NPM, you're just getting a PayPal script on your page to load the buttons. Option one, with that script tag, we're gonna drop the script into the index HTML, just like we would with any other plain HTML file. But then in our component, we're going to pull in a buttons driver. So you see on, I guess it's line nine here, you see PayPal button equals window.paypal.buttons.driver. Here it's a view example, so we're telling it load the view driver, and then we're passing the view instance. And then in our components list, we're um, just adding the PayPal buttons component so that in our template, we can drop in PayPal buttons and we'll see them on our page. And that's it. You can accept PayPal payments. It's that easy. Moving on to option two, um, this is that PayPal.js option, you would Install it from NPM, and then in your component, you're going to import load script, call load script, giving it your client ID um, and any other parameters that you want. In this case, we're just using the only required option, client ID. 
and then render the PayPal buttons to a container. With this option, we also can really easily catch errors. So if anything goes wrong, the internet connection gets messed up, whatever might cause the script loading to fail, we can also let users know or log that to let ourselves know um, that something's wrong and we maybe need to look at it. So that's really helpful as well. But otherwise, that's it. You've added PayPal buttons. You can accept payments online. It's that easy. And then the third option, React PayPal JS. Here, same thing, npm install. This time it's PayPal React JS. And then in your app JS, you'll import the script provider. And then you'll wrap all of that app code in the PayPal script provider. Here, as an option, we're passing in client ID, which is the only required option, but you could add more. And then in our checkout component, we import the PayPal buttons component and then show it there. Um, obviously, in a real world example, you might make it more complicated, but at its core, you're done. You've added the buttons, buy all the things. And so, yeah, all of these options are the very most basic, straightforward, simple, just get the buttons on the page options. Um, there's a lot more configuration that can be done if you want to. And so if you're new to this, I would say the first thing to look at is uh, the setup standard payments guide. And that'll walk you through um, getting started with a developer account and then some basic button configuration on just plain HTML, plain JavaScript just to get a feel for how they work and what your options are. And then um, as you get more comfortable with that, the JS SDK reference page is also really useful just to see what all of your options are because they're all listed out with a bit of detail on what they do and, and where they can be used and where they can. Um, also, if you want to play around with some of these examples and see how they work, you can go to github.com slash PayPal dash examples. And out there we have um, a view integration example that we saw earlier. Um, there's a Svelte example that we used. There's um, a React integration that uses that PayPal.js um, integration, not the React specific one. Um, there's also an Angular example that we didn't see today, but that's out there if you want to take a look. And then as a more real world example, I built a shop in Svelte. Um, it's not a very good shop, but it shows a little more of how dynamic variables changing can affect how your PayPal buttons work and a little more of how you might pass in some configuration. And yeah, thank you for listening to me talk. Um, happy to answer questions if anyone has them or if you want to contact me later, you can reach me at Twitter, um, Amy A. Egan. I'm also on GitHub. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, thank you so much for showing us how uh, we can quickly integrate uh, the PayPal SDKs into applications, regardless of what framework of choice you're using. I think the React integration was particularly elegant. Very, uh, I was going to say very swell, but that's the wrong framework. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, let's see. We do have one question. I think we have time for just one question here from okay. um, the question is, is it safe to have the client ID exposed in the client? Yes, because we limit a lot of what it can do. So it is very, um, I can't explain all the technical stuff because I'm not a security expert, but I know that we isolate things in a way that basically that client ID is only going to work to do you know, checkouts for that particular client. So nobody's going to be able to harness that to do anything other than give that merchant money. That's awesome. Thank you so much for the question and uh, for answering, AV. Um, we're yeah. running out of time here, um, but where can people find you if they want to ask you more questions or just follow you on Twitter? Sure, yeah. On Twitter, um, Amy A. Egan. I'm on GitHub, Amy Egan. that will also reference you back to Twitter. Um, and yeah, I'll be around. If anyone comments things or I don't know, whatever, find me on Twitter. That's easy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, JB. That was awesome. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about the SDK. Awesome. You're the best. Thanks. All right. 
Um, next up, we have Omar. And Omar is passionate about tech and music. And he tells me that he's also a guitarist and, from what I hear, a talented singer as well. Omar, uh, take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, can I can I hear it? Okay? Yeah? Loud and clear, yes. Okay. Uh, well, I'm not that really good singer, but I do my best. I'm taking <laughs> voice lists. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be talking about service workers and how to use them to mock APIs. So I think I'm going to start now. Okay. Okay, so starting. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here at JSConf 2021. I'm really happy to be here with you talking about API mocking with service workers. My name is Omar Asuna. I'm a front end engineer from Tijuana, Mexico. And let's get started. First of all, what are service workers? We can see this image, and it's going to help us understanding what service workers are. They're basically scripts that run in a separate thread in a browser. This is to avoid blocking the main UI thread. Otherwise, our interface in our browser would be frozen all the time. And our programmable network proxies. This means that we can uh, program all of the actions that we want to use when our application makes a request. Our service worker is going to intercept that request that we do to our servers. In, in the network, and we can use the cache API to cache the responses or requests. We can do some API mocking, like the one we're going to demonstrate in a later example in this presentation, and a lot of things more. And so the possibilities are endless. They cannot access the DOM directly or local storage because service workers by nature are 100% asynchronous. That's why you use a lot of promise. If you want to communicate with the DOM, we need to use a post message method that service workers provide. And they only run in HTTPS. This is to avoid having any man in the middle attack because anyone can sniff our data in, in a request if we only would be HTTP. And that's pretty dangerous because anyone can tamper our data. So where do we use service workers? Mainly when using PWAs, progressive web application, to develop offline first PWAs. And progressive web applications are basically web apps that can be installed cross platform in desktop or browser, and that use latest browser APIs and, and features like service workers in order to have a mobile app-like user experience. We can control and cache network requests on the browser, like what I mentioned. And we can have push notifications in background syncs. And this is really cool because it behaves like a native application being a web app. And this is a common question that I had when starting to learn about service workers. Are service workers and web workers the same? The answer is maybe. Yeah, maybe because they share some similarities, but they also have differences. And similarities of web and service workers are both running a secondary thread to avoid blocking the main UI thread. And they cannot interact with the DOM directly. Differences are mainly the main difference is that web workers cannot intercept network requests like service workers can, sorry, or listen to push, push API events. And the lifespan is tightly coupled to the tab they belong. That means is if we spawn 100 service worker, sorry, web workers in a tab, and if we close that tab, all of those 100 service workers that we spawn will be terminated. And a web app can only be controlled by one service worker at a time. And it can be independent of our application. That means if we close our tabs of our application or service workers, can still run on the background. How do we use service workers to mock API requests? This is the main question of the presentation. But first, I'm going to give a little bit of time so that you can take a picture or a screenshot or write the code down for this scavenger hunt dynamic that we are making here. Just a couple of seconds.
Okay, five, se five more seconds. Okay, we're good to go. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? That's why we need to use a library like Mock Service Worker in this example. Mock Service Worker works both on the browser and the server. It's easy to use and conf configure, and it supports both REST and GraphQL. This is pretty cool. There are some simple steps to follow. First, we need to define our handlers. Do we want to mock our REST API or a get, post, um, any put method, or do we want to mock GraphQL mutations or queries? After we decide and define our handlers, where do we want to run our mocks? On our server or in our browser? If it's on our server, we need to register a service worker and then set it up and start that worker. If it's on the server, we need to only set it up and start an interception layer because service workers can only be executed on the browser. That's a browser only feature and not in the server. So we're going to demonstrate this topic on mocking APIs and specifically REST with a sample application. This is Next.js application. And we have in this example, we're making API mocking for development purposes. Let's say that we are on the front end team of our company and we are making a contact form, a contact form with name, company, email, message. And it's a common scenario where the front end is a little bit ahead of the back end and we have te technical depth. So we need to advance as quick as possible. That's why we want to make a mock of this contact form that we're making the API request to a contact endpoint. In this example, I'm going to be mocking the application on the on the browser for this common first use case. So oh, basically in our Next.js application, we have an underscore app TSX component where we say, we say import mocks browser. This is just like a initialization file. This is basically saying, if we are in the browser, because Next.js can be, we can run code on the browser and also on the server. If we're on the browser and we're on development environment, because we don't want to run this in production, we're just developing a component by the meantime, well, start the worker and this worker calls this setup worker with the handlers. We say, we're mocking this contact endpoint of our contact form that we saw in here. And we, if we receive any name, company, email, message, and those are empty fields, we're going to return a 400 status code with this JSON object. Otherwise, we're going to return a 200 status code with this success JSON object. The cool about this is that we can see any of the network requests that we do in our network tab. And we say, we see that mocking is enabled. So that's a pretty good sign. Let's say that we make a, a fetch to the API when our fields are empty and we get the error message that we see in here. Please fill all of the fields. We, if we fill all of the fields, let's say Omar, PayPal, Omar at gmail.com, and we write a message in here, we're going to see the success response. Thank you for trusting us. We'll get in touch in, with you ASAP. That's why we mocked in here. And that's really cool, right? So the second use case is when we want to use MSW for testing purposes. In this example, we have a blog page and we populate this blog post by making a get request to this blog post endpoint. A headless CMS endpoint, your serverless function, your custom uh, REST API endpoint, whatever it is. So we're just saying get the blog post and then if all things went good, then we're going to return the, the post. Otherwise we're going to return an error. Sorry, we have problems getting the post. Try again later. So we want to test this behavior. We see that we have a try catch block in here and we can have two possible scenarios where we get the post successfully or when it fails and we get an error. So we want to test 
both cases. That's why we make two handlers. A first handler to mock a response with a 200 status code saying that we had successfully retrieved the blog, blog post, sorry. And the other is when we have some issues and it returned an error for 100 status code. This is what we return in our, in our success response handler, mocking that we retrieve some blog post. For this, since we cannot run service workers in our browser, we need to set up an interception layer, a request interception layer. I know this can be a little, mis a little bit misleading, set up server, but this is not an actual server. It's just the logic that how it works. So we listen to each request, and after our test pass, we just close the interception layer. This is the, the first test case where we get the blog post successfully. And this is the other test case when we got an error and it failed. So we can make sure that this test run correctly by running npm run test. And all of the tests passed, as you can see. Uh, basically, that was it. Uh, I know it was a little bit rushed, but that's because of the time constraint that we have. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions. And if you want to look at the code more in depth, you can check devosuna uh, slash next MSW example. This is the code repo that I made. And I wrote a readme explaining a bit more about this. So uh, I think I think that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Omar. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about that today. Uh, service workers are Thank the best, and mock Thank service you. worker is absolutely dope. So if you haven't checked it out, do check out Omar's link uh, and the resources that he uh, provided are, are spot on. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's good stuff. It really, really is a big boon for developer productivity. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. You Love can use it on testing, development, or bug tracking, a lot of yeah. use cases. Yeah. It's really cool. That's really awesome. Um, we are uh, running close to time here, but I did want to ask you, if folks want to reach out to you later to ask you questions or just stalk you on Twitter, where can they find you? Okay, sure. Uh, I didn't have a Twitter account, so I created <laughs> one for, for this event. Uh, I'm new on Twitter, I'm like Deb Osuna, but I also have a, a webpage, omarosuna.com. So All right. you can go to my page and my LinkedIn is in that page or my, my GitHub as well. Awesome. Thank Omar you very much. Osuna.com, everyone. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much again. Appreciate it. Bye. Have a, have a nice day, everyone. All right. Thanks, Omar. Next up, oops, let me share my screen here so we can uh, pop this up again. There we go. Next up, we have Matt Edelman and Sumin Kakar. Matt, of course, you remember as our keynote speaker from earlier. Uh, if you did not know, Matt actually lives on a legitimate farm, all right? in Austin. He has um, two dogs, four cats, six cows, a uh, few goats lying here and there, uh, more ducks than you can count, and about 50 chickens. So um, yeah, Matt literally lives on a farm and he's awesome. He's also um, co-presenting with Sumit today. Sumit is a web engineer lead on web platform engineering. And this guy is a monster on the trails. He loves going on hikes. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Matt and Sumit. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks, Titus. Cool. Uh, well, welcome. Welcome, everybody, to this talk. Um, let me pull up our slide deck really quick. And I am not able to see uh, StreamYard anymore. So let me know when you can see this, Sumit, or anybody. 
Yeah, I can see it. Uh, awesome. Yeah, yeah, it looks good. Cool. All right. So who are we? Uh, so as, as Titus mentioned, um, the both of us are on the web platform engineering team. Um, I've been managing the team for about four years and the, uh, the web platform team provides two major uh, platform components for web developers at PayPal. One, we provide the, the node um, infrastructure and uh, sample app to get started with. And really we support the full SDLC for web development at PayPal on the Node.js side. We also provide uh, CDN support. We uh, provide um, SDLC for, for CDN. Uh, so uh, staging, uh, testing, and deploying files to our CDN origin is, is managed by uh, our team. And uh, Sumit is, is the lead engineer on the node side, but uh, he can really play any role across the whole portfolio and the team uh, does you know basically we we kind of switch roles as we need to uh, depending on the need on those two sides CDN versus Node. Um, today we're we're mainly going to be talking about uh, Node JS uh, in terms of um, Next JS. Uh, before we get there though, I just wanted to make a shout out uh, to anybody who's not at PayPal now but perhaps considering it that we are hiring. We have five positions open on this team right now. Two of them are in Bangalore and three of them are in Austin, Texas. Uh, of course, nobody's in the office right now, but we do tie um, jobs to a particular location. Um, but yeah, we're, we're obviously all working remotely. Uh, so let me just leave that up for a second. I didn't uh, make a bit.ly um, URL. So if anybody wants to, to take that down really quick and you can always reach out uh, later on, or we can share it on the YouTube channel as well. But without further ado, let's move on to the agenda. So we want to talk about uh, what problem we're trying to solve with Next.js, um, and then why we chose it, go into a, a technical deep dive, uh, and then we'll talk a bit about the, the adoption strategy uh, for, for Next.js at PayPal. First of all, uh, the problem statement. Um, web developers at PayPal and probably at a lot of other uh, development houses as well, they'll start um, with some sort of example app that some other team maintains. Uh, and then they'll build their use case and their business logic onto that sample app that will then move to production and they'll maintain that application going forward. And that's that's what we do here at PayPal as well. So the web platform team owned every time a team uh, needs to start a new node project. Uh, and then within that sample application is all the middleware that, that uh, the web platform team maintains uh, to handle things like service discovery, logging, um, uh, tons of other stuff, key material handling, all, all those concerns that um, if you're just developing business logic, you really don't want to get your hands into that. So we maintain all of that in the sample application and then uh, teams just build on top of it. The current sample application at PayPal is using you know, pr uh, proprietary tooling that was built in house here to do things like um, you know, build, install, lint, uh, all that stuff, um, you know, spinning up your dev environment, uh, and it works really well as long as you're just using the commands that come out of the box. But as soon as you want to do something like customize your Webpack config or or any other thing that's that's sort of custom, it becomes it becomes kind of a problem uh, for developers because this is proprietary tooling, and it's not familiar to anybody coming from outside of PayPal. So that, essentially, the problem statement is: How do we give something uh, to web developers that they can start with that makes sense? that has um, a community already existing uh, outside of PayPal that solved a lot of uh, you know, edge case problems that people may run into um, with, without burdening them or, or the web platform team. Uh, so in other words, how do we get away from this enigmatic um, you know, proprietary solution? And we uh, we found that the answer would be Next.js. And at this point, uh, I'll hand it over to Sumit, who's going to take us through um, the most of the rest of the slides. 
in this um, uh, in this slide, I think what Mark is trying to cover is everything you can find on Next.js website. You know, it's it's an open source. Uh, you know, industry is aware of this, uh, and there's a, a good developer experience. And uh, you know, it has some really cool features like uh, you know dynamic server or and client side rendering. And it has built-in optimization. Um, uh, you know, you can you can do uh, start. You can build static uh, content. And you know, when we were reaching out to uh, some of our folks and to to gauge the interest uh, of uh, you know next years, and the couple of comments here, uh, you know, you can read it. I can I can just uh, read it for you. I believe it is easier to ramp up on next years than uh, content. The current tooling, which I personally hate because of all the mental uh, calisthenics you have to go through just to figure out what the hell is happening. Another one is adopting a community-backed technology like Next.js can uh, distribute knowledge more evenly and allow devs to learn from a wider community. So these are just two, but you know there they are many like this. Can you move to the next slide? A very frank comment. <laughs> All right, I think this is this is important. You know why PayPal is Next.js? Node.js applications like PayPal are mainly used uh, as frontier applications. And they have common attributes like serving UI, um, APIs which need which may need authentication, and they'll call uh, microservices uh, for request processing. Uh, and they they do some common things. You know they have to load uh, applications local and uh, remote configurations. Uh, you know they have to determine uh, topology, uh, load credential search for uh, making uh, downstream service calls, and other, uh, and then they have to load other keys and secrets for any special needs. Uh, applications are uh, unable to choose the authentication strategy. You know we, we support cookie, access token, SSO. Uh, they have uh, you know security included, so the. The, the, when they are used, you know, uh, application uh, the product development doesn't have to do anything. Uh, they also uh, include common uh, layouts, uh, you know, uh, headers, footers, uh, so that you know there's a consistency across uh, PayPal. Uh, logging, error processing, metric capture, and other features like internationalization, uh, rate limiting, device detection are included. Uh, eventually, the applications have to be deployed and need support for CDN, uh, health checks. And you know, eventually, you know, once they are deployed, uh, they have to support internal routing. You know, how the request will reach to them eventually. All this uh, is you know uh, enabled uh, in the uh, you know typical applications at PayPal. Beyond this, uh, you know, we also want to make Next.js configurable, uh, configuration consistent across apps, um, so that uh, there is a common. Um, Behavior, and then uh, consistent UI experience is also important. Uh, and then UI libraries help us with that. Uh, and then we want to enable these by default. Uh, next slide. Right. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just uh, cover a little bit of history. Uh, framework used for Node.js applications at PayPal is built over Kraken.js. Uh, Kraken.js and uh, related modules uh, were open sourced by PayPal uh, way back in 2013. Uh, you can you can go to GitHub slash Kraken.js and you can see a lot of uh, uh, modules there. They are, they are used also you know outside PayPal. Uh, Kraken.js uh, and the, and the, all those modules make Express.js configurable. Uh, Really helps, uh, especially uh, to control the Node.js uh, Node application lifecycle, like you know, uh, during the you know from loading to uh, setting up middlewares. This also means that the existing application at PayPal and their dependencies are designed around these modules. Uh, this and uh, you know other constraints, uh, which you know listed and we'll cover in uh, next slides, uh, impact the implementation uh, impacted the impl implementation decisions. Yeah, let's let's go into the details. Uh, next slide. Uh, dependency on uh, you know uh, Express JS. Uh, you know, there's a heavy ex dependency on Express JS because you know Kraken is used uh, uh, everywhere. Um, 
infrastructure dependencies are uh, leveraging, uh, you know, Connect Express style uh, middlewares. Uh, uh, methods and properties injected by Express uh, are used um, throughout. And then we also use uh, uh, some of the uh, infrastructure uh, or the core dependencies, uh, you know, create uh, Express sub apps. And then they inject the infrastructure routes, you know, common routes, which you'll, you'll, uh, we have in all applications. And then these sub apps are then added to the uh, main Express app. Means that this infra infrastructure is already built and, you know, we can't move away. Uh, from Express, unless we rewrite everything, which is a huge task. Next slide. Uh, you know, there are a couple of uh, other things. You know, pay at PayPal, we use uh, Confi module uh, for configurations. Uh, this is again open sourced. Uh, the load mechanism uh, and the container object, which contains the uh, configuration, is that signature of that is pretty unique. Uh, and changing it. Uh, its usage everywhere is a big challenge. Uh, next slide. Uh, Metalware, again, an open source uh, module, offers a unique way of uh, configuring, uh, initiating, and running middlewares. Uh, you know, to give you an example, uh, it even allows uh, running middlewares in parallel, and there are other schemes too. And middlewares at PayPal are built to benefit from this. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is another important thing. Uh, uh, error handling mechanism um, at PayPal uh, basically leverages a dedicated microservice, uh, which handles 404 and uh, 500 errors, so that the experience is consistent across apps. Uh, typically, the, uh, the UI is not part of the applications. Uh, and then we don't want developers to add uh, server error uh, UI in in Next.js apps, you know, just to uh, be consistent. And you know, this is this is just a screenshot of the UI we are uh, showing right now, which is coming from that microservice. So that's another constraint we have. We have to support that use case. Uh, next slide. Uh, another uh, important thing uh, for uh, you know when we were. Uh, Looking at the implementation, uh, is the the way uh, applications are built at PayPal. You know, single page React JS applications are common, and uh, they typically use a Reach router or a React router. And if we have to migrate them, uh, you know, without a need for major UI refactoring, uh, we have to make sure that we support at least the, the high level. Uh, you know client-side rendered components that, which are created there. And what we did, uh, you know, when we were uh, trying to implement this, we, this is an, uh, a code snippet from uh, what we implemented. You know, default uh, dot, 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 default JS is a, a catch-all route. And then uh, if you look at it, look at uh, in there, there's get server-side properties, which means uh, it's a server-side rendered and the layout properties which you are getting are, are coming from a dedicated microservice, so that you know layout is consistent throughout. And then, um, uh, if the uh, you know if there's an existing application which is again client side rendered React uh, application, it can just be uh, it can leverage the dynamic import of uh, Next.js and set uh, server side render to false, and then and then just just load it. This is this is small part of it. You know there are other moving. Pieces around it, but you know, gives a sense of uh, how we are uh, achieving this. Next slide, please. As part of this uh, refactoring, when we were building this sample app, uh, you know, we also wanted that uh, we were also considered that you know, uh, next year should not be the only option. And uh, what we did was to uh, uh, refactor the infrastructure. And then um, decouple the core framework code, and then uh, have it uh, basically separated out. Uh, what benefits it gave uh, were, you know, of course, testability, uh, extendability, in, you know, in, for, in case we want to up update something in future, uh, stuff like that. And then uh, how this would be used uh, is, you know, there would be probably a glue shim module which which can be created uh, specific to the web framework. 
And then, um, uh, and what we did was we have this uh, glue created for our sample app, and then uh, all the uh, uh, you know cloned applications would eventually use this glue. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, what we uh, the features uh, uh, we build uh, as part of the sample app, uh, you know. I have talked about SPA example. What it offers is common layout components. Uh, it supports internationalization, uh, you know, uh, GDPR banner, you know, because some of the stuff is uh, server side rendered. Uh, we have uh, API examples. We have the next uh, JS API example and uh, GraphQL API example. Uh, and then we also made sure that we include the PayPal UI libraries uh, by default. And then um, there's client side logging, uh, error handling, which I covered, you know, just unique at PayPal, uh, which is different from the regular next year's uh, ways of doing things. And then uh, unit test uh, um, using Jest, uh, functional test using Cypress. And then we also added uh, uh, linting and coverage, uh, whatever was needed for that. Yeah, next slide. So, uh, Here's a screenshot of uh, you know our existing sample app. Now, remember, this is just a sample app. Uh, you know there are a lot of uh, uh, technology working uh, behind this, so don't go by don't judge by the UI. Uh, but you know it, it's functional. That's that's the more important thing. Uh, and then um, and then there's uh, uh, the next one is the current uh, uh, next year space experience. So if you look at it, it's pretty much the same. And that that is that was our goal. You know, this is uh, we version zero of uh, Next.js app, and we wanted to offer same experience as uh, what we are already offering to developers, and hope that they it hope that this makes it easy for developers to relate to what they already have. Um, and then uh, you know, uh, all the Next.js capabilities are available. Um, you know, uh, uh, building uh, static uh, pages or you know server side rendering and all. And we do not uh, impose any restrictions. All right. So the next slide is about um, demo. So let me do this. Let me share my screen. All right, so um, this is our existing sample app, which is uh, React-based. Uh, uh, sorry to cut in, but uh, if you're sharing your screen, would you mind trying to share it one more time? I think I don't think we were able to see it quite yet. Can you see it now? Oh, not quite yet. Are you using the um, share button at the bottom of the screen? Yeah, I am. Uh, let me. Uh, it could be uh, permissions issues too. Ah. Oh, I didn't test that part. Um, <laughs> There's always something, right? <laughs> so, uh, okay. Um, what I have actually in the previous slide, I've uh, anyway shared the. Um, the our existing application, and that is what I wanted to cover. It basically uh, uh, uses a Reach Router internally. It has uh, uh, Matt, if you can share the the previous slide, and then I can just talk over. Uh, the previous yes previous one yes so if you look at it, uh, the first screen uh, it has uh, two um, routes uh, there's home and uh, there's help and then uh, it uses a reach router uh, or you know you can always uh, change it to react router uh, and then um, this is a single page application which is uh, which we we use templating uh, to uh, Rendered uh, stuff, uh, especially the 
the layouts and uh, and uh, you know CSRF and stuff like that. Uh, and then uh, and then there's a client uh, component which is a React app. And then uh, the next uh, the next CS app pretty much does the same thing and uses the code snippet I shared. Uh, it we also gave uh, you know for uh, an example uh, uh, a link uh, a React uh, next JS uh, route link you know that's the about link we have, which basically uses the it's it that's again server side rendered but you know just an example. That is what I wanted to share. All right, over to you, Matt. Okay. Yeah, so the, the next question is, so, you know, again, what we have is parity between the existing sample app and the, the Next.js sample app. Um, and what you see in terms of the UI is really the tip of the iceberg, um, you know, from, from this team standpoint, uh, getting, you know, getting the tip of the iceberg out there for web developer teams to use it is the point. That's the point of, of, of what we're doing. Um, so, you know, proof of concept, I would say it's beyond proof of concept. Um, uh, we, you know, we've got essentially a working application. Um, and the next step uh, from our standpoint was to uh, raise awareness of this, uh, which, which we, we have done and we're doing, we're currently doing it right this moment. Uh, and then get, you know, this, pattern into production, which is actually in progress now as well. There's there's a team that's uh, moving towards production with it. And uh, I think the probably the, well, I don't want to say the hardest part, but a, a difficult part will be how do we, um, you know, induce people to migrate from an existing application uh, to this pattern so that we don't have too much, uh, too many different patterns of application in the ecosystem that, that makes uh, support difficult and upgrades uh, somewhat difficult. So those are, you know, things that we are thinking about now. Uh, in terms of the developer awareness aspect, uh, we had a hackathon last month where we asked uh, developers to take the sample app, build on top of it, uh, you know, any use case that they that they really wanted to. Uh, and just we wanted to see what the um, enthusiasm would be. And we were pleasantly surprised to see that there was over 100 developers that were interested in this. And in the Slack channel that, that we had for the purpose over the course of a week, there was, I mean, hundreds of messages. Uh, people were really digging in, uh, found some just some things that we had missed just in terms of, you know, does it install and that sort of stuff. But, you know, getting past those growing pains, um, there was a few teams that built some really cool um, hacks on top of it, um, which uh, <laughs> I apologize. I don't have any screenshots for you of, of those. I was a little hesitant about, uh, you know, based on this being a public conference. Uh, but we got a lot of engagement. Uh, we got some solutions for, for some known issues from our community, specifically from our World Ready team that helped to solve, uh, or I'm sorry, it was actually the um, a UI component team that helped to solve a problem that, that we weren't quite sure what to do with. Um, and again, I think getting, getting that early information um, from developers has helped us to make a, a better product for when we do roll it out. Uh, so that's basically the story on, on awareness. And again, in terms of adoption, that that's ongoing. So you know, just to take a wild guess, I would say in six months we would have um, you know this would be generally available. People would be using it. Uh, I'm not sure how much uh, migration we would have from the older version apps to the to this, uh, but I think we would want to see you know some maybe 20% of apps that are on the current um, architecture migrating to this next JS architecture. Uh, so that's really the end of, of our presentation, and we're definitely, you know, if there's any questions that folks have about, uh, you know, how we have adopted Next.js or how we've, you know, solved any of the problems that, that may occur to you or any other uh, other things related to Next.js, uh, feel free to ask. Thanks so much, Matt and Savit. That was, uh, it's really, really awesome to see sort of from your perspective, uh, tackling such a large undertaking, you know, transitioning from one massive set of infrastructure, not just for a single team, but for 
all teams, right, in a way that makes sense and in a way that caters to everyone's use cases. Uh, I think the strategies that you uh, outlined in terms of uh, identifying like the pers pervasive tooling and technologies that are in place, right, the incumbents, and figuring out how to refactor around those pieces, using the hackathon to drive awareness and also to encourage people to explore and add new functionality. I think that was a really, really good way to uh, go about doing it. And uh, yeah, the community at PayPal, I can speak for, are very excited about it. Um, we do have a couple questions in the YouTube chat. Um, the first one is from Brian, and I think we might have addressed this a little bit, but Brian is asking, what teams use Next.js in production today? So I think it's a credit team, right? Or is it an identity team? I forget which which team is, is working towards production with that. Samit, do you remember? Yeah, I think it's uh, one of the credit teams who who are evaluating, who are actually building application right now. Awesome. So, uh, so it's not on production yet. Just, just kind yeah, of. I would call that pretty early adoption. So we're, you know, thank you for your bravery. Um, you know, with with this, it's it'll 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 be safe. We know that. Um, but it's, you know, as far as support goes, it's it's um, early adopters do have to kind of get out there, you know, in front of their skis a bit. So. Thanks for that, but we're we're right behind you. <laughs> we do love our early adopters. <laughs> uh, next, we have a question from Greg. Greg is asking, uh, looking forward to learning uh, Next.js. Oh, that's not actually a comment. Sorry, <laughs> more more of a just a, a shout out. So, uh, thanks, Greg, for that nice comment. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. I do have. Uh, one question uh, for both of you, uh, since since we have you on the uh, on the line here, uh, and that is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's uh, PayPal is a large company, right? There's so many different teams with so many unique uh, needs and requirements, um, and you you talked about some of the challenges, right, that you faced when migrating over to Next.js. But in terms of sort of the final steps, now that you're kind of entering a mature beta phase and you're kind of getting ready to roll this out, like what are some of those last line of defense things that you're doing to ensure a successful rollout? Well, I mean, I think the, the main thing is um, creating a path for teams to get from where they are, you know, on the existing application architecture to this one. And until we have that, I don't think we you know, we wouldn't call it generally available or, or ready. Uh, the, the biggest task I think that the web platform team has is making sure that applications are secure and have the latest versions of, of modules uh, to basically to track with all the, the changes that are happening on the infrastructure side of things. So until we can ensure that we can quickly roll things out across the ecosystem, we're not going to wholesale, you know, create a, a big change in the ecosystem. Um, so that's, I mean, that, that's our, you know, sort of what we're looking at as far as how we address that. Um, I, I don't think we're ready to really talk about that yet, but that's that's the biggest thing, like rolling change out from uh, an infrastructure team to the number of microservices that we have is, we have to be very careful. Yeah, I think another thing I wanted to add, wanted to add is that there are not that many uh, teams who are building new applications, right? So the use cases which would come up would be, uh, Existing applications who want to uh, get benefit, you know, uh, adopt not next years and you know get benefits out of it, which also means that they have a lot of existing code and you know it probably would work in a hybrid model. And I think the the goal for us is to engage, work with the team, understand the use cases, and try to solve them. And you know that's the that's the goal for us. And that's why we had considered a lot of other factors. You know when we were building the sample app. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I see there is a question. Another and, uh, question, yeah. Yeah. What are some problems specific to PayPal that Next.js has solved from Brian? I don't know uh, that. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't know that this is a specific PayPal problem, but I think uh, developer tooling is the main, uh, you know, concern that we had. And, uh, you know, we had raised it in the early slide. Basically, we have developer tooling now. It's just that it's proprietary. And if you want help with it, you've got to ask within the pool of developers at PayPal who are using it, which is a fairly small pool. Um, so that's, I think that's the main, uh, you know, problem that that we were trying to solve, at least, you know, 
from what from what we deal with and then you know that's in terms of developer pain points and helping support them during that phase of of the product life cycle um but in terms of how the application gets built and deployed i think there's some other problems that nextjs solves there as well thanks ryan for the question um unless we have any other questions I'll give people a couple more seconds if they want to finish typing down their questions in the comments below. But, uh, other, but otherwise, um, one last question for you guys. Um, where is a good place to reach out if people have additional questions or if they'd just like to, to ping you on Twitter or whatnot? Where, where should they go for, for that? Uh, you can search for me on LinkedIn. You can look for Matt Edelman. There's probably a few of Matt Edelman's, but uh, I'm the one that works at PayPal. So that, that's a good way to contact. And, and especially if you're um, thinking about, uh, you know, whether you may want to work at PayPal, that's a great place to connect. Um, so I would recommend LinkedIn for me. Yeah, I mean, my first name, last name, uh, single word, that's typically what I use. So. Awesome. Yeah. I, I can vouch. It's a great team. Uh, they're working on some really amazing stuff. So uh, definitely apply if you're looking for anything. So thank you both awesome. so much again for your time. Really, really great hearing about the journey. Uh, and uh, until next time, um, that, is, that was Matt and Sumit, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now it's break time until 2.45. We have a very special guest speaker from the Apollo um, who will be talking about GraphQL Apollo Federated uh, Federation. So stay tuned for that and see you all at 2.45.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back from the break. Uh, today, we have a very special guest, uh, Dan from uh, Apollo. Uh, Dan, let me cue you up so you can so we can all see your face here. There. All hey, right. Dan, how's it going? Hi, everybody. It's great. <laughs> can you hear us? It, I can. Thanks. All right. Um, yeah, so Dan, it's really great to have you on the show today. Um, we are just tickled to have you. Um, Thank you. You are a uh, graph champion at Apollo, <laughs> right? And uh, you joined recently. You have a very long, illustrious career uh, finding ways to help people uh, build better products, uh, products like Expedia. Um, you love traveling. Uh, and right now, you're not doing a lot of that anymore. <laughs> but um, today, uh, you're sharing with us how uh, companies have been using the federated graph to create solutions that are greater than the sum of their parts. Uh, very intriguing. Uh, so with that said, uh, everyone, give it up for Dan. Thanks. <laughs> I love the virtual. I do miss I do miss doing this in a real uh, conference, and I can't wait to get back to that soon. Okay, let me start in. Um, I first of all, thank you, Titus, and thanks to PayPal for this great opportunity to talk to you all. Um, I do get to champion the graph. That's actually my title. How great is that? Um, let's start in. So. Apollo's been at the center of GraphQL development, right, since things really started and GraphQL uh, came out of Facebook. The key point I want to make, in addition to, you know, we have obviously a lot of open source tools that uh, folks use, and we've authored the open source um, federation specification, but those logos on the right really are the North Star. Those are all the companies we've been working with, and there's more that aren't even fit on that slide. And the things I'll share with you today are the things that we've learned from them and with them. So we're really excited to be able to share that with you um, and want you to also reach out and add uh, your thoughts and learnings to the greater community. So I thought I would start with sort of a real quick grounding in the why of the adoption. Um, I mean, that is a great curve, isn't it? That's the Apollo client download curve. And it is almost precisely an exponential like on the curve fit. Um, that's 100,000 of you um, who have added GraphQL on your LinkedIn profiles. Um, there's all those websites. That's a bottom-up developer-driven adoption, isn't it? Right. That's not. Uh, that's not because um, I give talks at PayPal conferences. Although we try to hope that helps, but this is a real organic movement. So let's talk a little bit about why it's happening and what the essential nature is of GraphQL that uh, enables it. This is really at the heart of what most of us do, right? A lot of us do. We try to build digital products. There's enormous pressure to go fast. There's all kinds of competition. Um, and what's happened in the last year has only accelerated that, right? There's no real secure moats anymore. Um, people are selling all kinds of things that, they, that uh, they're moving into maybe your company's territory. Um, and the essential nature is that we've got services on the right, right, and products on the, on the left. If you wanna move fast, if you wanna have experiences across now omni-channel, right? So it's tough enough when it's just web and iOS and Android, but there's more now. Um, you, we've got a real challenge on your hands. So let's talk about why that is. These are the classic services on the right, classic apps on the left, um, the services representing the raw capabilities. And the key point about this is that those lines don't really go anywhere, right? They represent the core sort of canonical information you can get out of a user service or a product service. And those service teams work really hard to have the most, maybe maybe the driest, if you will, um, description of their capabilities. But what they don't try to provide, right, are integrated solutions where you pull those pieces together because products have prices. It's very likely the product service and the price service are different as they were at my old company, reviews as well, favorites. We gotta put those things together. And what happens when we do, right? Where, where are the solutions? Where is the product? Um, it, well, we know the answer to the question. It's in the it's in the edge, right? It's in the apps. Um, it's in JavaScript a lot of times. Um, and while that worked, and all of us uh, have built some great application experiences with that, um, it doesn't come without cost because as the, those products get richer, and the service um, services that we want to integrate with them get larger in number in count, um, we have a real problem on our hands, right? Don't we? So, in a model like this. What happens when I want to run an experiment across all of our experiences? 
Well, that was the problem that we faced. Um, at my last company, and I know a lot of e-commerce um, retailers face that same problem. What if, what if the design team decides they want to adopt a new design system and they want to really clean up the user UI and make it consistent? How do I do that when all the business logic and the orchestration is sitting in different separate pieces of code? And then what do I do about um, modernization, right? How do I adopt the latest front end platform or frankly, the latest back end architecture without breaking all those wires, all those extension cords? Well, you, you know, you're not the only one to wonder those questions. And what we all can have to acknowledge, I think, is that we've hit kind of a point of diminishing returns with that model. Um, tightly coupled systems have that property, don't they? That um, the more we add to them, the slower our product, uh, you know, productivity is. And, and we're not, of course, you know, everybody's felt that curve. It wasn't just um, my company. Uh, we hear it from all our customers. And essentially the front ends um, developers, what they'll tell you is that they're doing almost everything except the thing that they joined the company to do, the thing that they want to do, which is to focus on building great experiences. So that's an un, um, unsustainable status quo. Um, and we've got better answers though, don't we? That's what's exciting, right? So let's talk about, after set that table, let's talk about what is it about GraphQL and the way we use it that solves some of those problems. I think fundamentally, um, the key the key bit to keep in mind is that we finally have an API tech, you know, built for product teams, right? Um, it's not the services deriving their abstract goodness and then hoping that people can integrate it together. It's actually an API tech that was designed to build rich experiences on the edge, right, at the, at the client side. And what that means is that operations and the queries, they're shaped for their use. And not just in the obvious way, which is you only request the data in a GraphQL query that you want and need for your experience. And so that sense, the shape is very much in your hands. But it's also true that the nature of those schema definitions, those types, those should be uh, a conversation, right? A collaboration between the raw capabilities that the service teams have and the models that they use and the models that the views use. And it's that center middle layer where we have a, finally a proper layer to start capturing solutions and decisions. And then we have to build a platform that's designed for that new layer, right? That allows us to connect those teams together, but not in a coupled way, not in a bound way around a versioned endpoint, but around something more abstract. Um, and that allows the services to finally be in service um, to, the, to the creation of products, which is really exciting. So let's talk about the benefits. Um, they're, they're really pretty classic on the front end. Um, we all know them if you've been to any or looked at any GraphQL presentations or read uh, or used it, right? You've got um, a lot of the friction that front end developers and the waste in the, um, in the API calls goes away. Um, and that's great. It lets those teams um, do the things that they um, join to do. But at the bottom there, we show that all of the things that build up to a larger set of productivity, right? And that single source of truth idea, how do you have a graph that captures what is sort of true and maybe durably true, right? It's not directly linked one-to-one -one with um, what the view model or potentially the, um, I should say even more, the, the client architecture, like say React or or Vue.js or any of the other kinds of solutions or, or Swift UI for that matter. And it's not completely bound to the backends, right? Those models are also the contributing, but um, there is something that can survive longer. And I tell you, one of the benefits um, of working at a company as long as I did was I got to see our core applications built three times on three platforms. So if you wanna know why I championed the graph, it's because of that. Um, they didn't even get as, um, they didn't improve as much as we would have liked to them improve between because we were so busy recreating a lot of that code that was thrown away on the on the uh, services side and on the um, front end side. So let's go a little bit deeper. Let's talk about the how. That's a great story, but how did we pull this off? Like I said, we've worked with hundreds of companies and we've kind of identified these four um, pillars for some ingredients, if you will, since I'm close to the kitchen. Uh, for how to have a successful graph project, right? And it starts with mindset change. Um, the graph's essential nature is different, isn't it? 
than the essential nature of point to point APIs. And understanding those differences and thinking through the implications of that are really important. Um, and in our hurry to get that first graph service up, sometimes we skip that step. Um, change at scale within organizations, it's not easy. And the graph, if it's going to deliver that sort of new solutions layer and that point of collaboration, which it can and does, then we have to think about how we um, approach it, right? How we communicate, how we build communities within teams uh, and our companies um, to apply those mindsets. So that's what that champion's guide that I'm excited to share, like we just launched last uh, month. And we'll talk about a little bit at the end of the conversation if we have time. Um, but then, you know, that's great. Mindset's important, but how do you apply it? So we, um, all the choices that go into how you build your graph, right, are, are fundamental. And what we've seen is that if you get those mostly right and increasingly right as you work and learn, you just have a much better experience than if you don't. So that's why we, years ago, wrote them up in principlegraphql.com, which if you haven't seen is a great starting point um, for principal design. But also we've been adding a lot of guides uh, and our GraphQL at scale series, and you're gonna see more of that over the summer. So stay tuned on that. The final two pillars, declarative foundation, um, the third. The fundamental nature of GraphQL is that it declaratively describes its schemas. And we've extended that model with Federation to be able to encode the relationship between types, right? And hints so that you can run efficient queries across them. Um, this is just like reactive front ends are declarative uh, in event-driven models, right? And new containerization strategies and Kubernetes and others are sort of convict-driven on the back end. Um, this is such a powerful idea to describe what you want to have happen and then have the system um, build it for you and, and handle it for you. So we're following that pattern for sure. And lastly, there's a platform, right, that, that runs that um, and gives you introspection and ability to see over time how that scheme is changing, get notifications, have effective routing um, and efficient querying. Essentially, all the components that make up a really healthy life cycle. So that's, that's the point we'll talk about in a minute, but this idea of starting to think about the graph and its change in the way that you do lifecycle as a first class lifecycle element within your sort of development world is really helpful. So let's go quickly into Federation. And that sounds complicated, doesn't it sound advanced, Federation? Um, it's really pretty simple at its core, right? The idea is it's a consequence of not wanting to have a single monolithic graph or graph service. Um, a lot of companies explore that, that peak of monolithism and uh, they've all now broken up their graphs because it's not practical, right? Um, you want teams to be able to um, build their own subgraphs, uh, reason about them, test them, validate them, and then yet add them to a greater, and, um, a greater whole. So here we've got real quickly users, products, prices, and reviews as subgraphs. And notice that that query, if you can, um, if you can look at it real close there, you'll see I'm asking for, you know, I've got a product info subquery, I've got a price, a product price subquery, and a product review subquery. That's federation. That's three subqueries going to three subgraphs, back into four. Um, well, with the with the me ID four services, um, that's fantastic, right? This is, this is amazing. The front ends have a single query, they get their data back. This, this is a great place to start and it's where a lot of companies start and get a lot of value organically out of the graph at the beginning. But as you evolve, you, know, you can start to evolve your schema. You can start to capture more of the true relationships between those types. And here we've got an example, you know, users have reviews, right? Products also have reviews and they have prices. And so you can use the, the keywords and, um, inside of your schema to hint and describe and, and more than hint and to specify explicitly how those uh, elements share keys, uh, which types extend other types. And then that allows the query planner, Apollo's query planner and the router to run a very efficient query across them and take advantage of any parallelism um, that, that can be done. So that's, that's how you evolve incrementally. And that's at the heart of Federation, right? It lets you evolve iteratively with some safety. What's the implication for teams? Well, 
what I'll, what I'll argue is that it's mostly about focus and, and, um, and, and then focused collaboration. So most of the time, front end teams, they're making queries and they're using that data and they're building experiences. And most of the time, the service teams over on the right are adding new capabilities and exposing them into the graph. Or they're working on scaling and infrastructure changes. Once they're behind a safe, durable, sort of type safe contract, they can actually rewrite their services without having to worry about client migrations. And if you've ever worked on a service team and had to do client migrations with people that you know don't want to get off your old versions, uh, that's a lot of time that frees up. And with that time, service teams, they can turn around and, and give um, support to those front end teams and add new features into the graph. They don't have to manage a new endpoint. They don't have to manage versioning. It's a lot better. But but essentially, even maybe more importantly than those two abilities for focus, which is key, it's this, um, what the graph is doing is it's encouraging us, it's actually provoking us to have a real conversation about what is the right contract that captures the capabilities from the services and yet the expressiveness and the model that is closer to what the product teams need, okay? And that is a, that's a conversation that can happen up front instead of later then instead of like after the APIs are written, here you go, do you need anything else? It's, hey, how are we gonna model this? And once we do get that modeling figured out, we can mock that right off the bat, free up the front end team, we can decouple and those teams are working in parallel. So kind of a zoom in here, um, what do we do with, what can we do with all those declarative, uh, you know, capabilities built into the schema? Well, it's kind of shocking. Um, here's an example uh, of, our Explorer tool, right? And there's a query in the middle. I don't know if you can read the details, but I'm asking for products and, and reviews and some prices. The key here is statically, just at design time, I can generate a query plan, right? I can see the different subgraphs that are gonna get called and ultimately the services. I can see which are gonna be parallel, which are gonna be in serial. Now, I might not want to know or need to know that, but boy, it is nice sometimes. Um, to understand what the implication is of a particular query before you make it, right? And on the back end side, service teams can see that too. And that gives them great insight into the overall um, the overall request of the user interface, right? Not just the service use, but the actual product use. And that lets them, you know, lets them cache where they need to cache. It lets them um, optimize where they need to optimize. And what's the net result of all of this, right? Well, we're moving from tightly coupled where we kind of hit the ceiling of productivity to composable, right? I add things to, each thing I add to a graph in this way means that I get more productivity out of the system, not less. Now there's the curve and the curves overlap. Now in the beginning, yeah, it's a little bit of work to set up your first graph, right? There's coordination, there's learning, um, there's some mindset changes, just like there was when we adopt React or Kubernetes, right? There is um, a learning curve, but boy, the, the productivity curve just increases and accelerates and that's what we need. Um, so real quickly, um, I'm, I'm not gonna steal, I've got a, the talk I believe right after this is PayPal, I'm not gonna steal their thunder, um, they're a fantastic customer and they're using it to manage all kinds of complexity with the companies that they've acquired and then all the different versions of their, or not versions, but sort of you know customizations of the graph that they want to present to all their partners. So they'll talk about that journey. I'm going to highlight just a couple. Walmart's got this really exciting project. This is, um, I've worked on projects like this, and even this one um, just so impresses me. They've got two platforms, right? One for their classic e commerce set of applications and user interface, and then one for their in store stuff, right? Picking up uh, orders and ordering groceries. They've been very um, different, right? Those are just completely decoupled, as they typically are in large companies, right? Different teams, different histories. They're using Federation to build the API, like sometimes I say that, that they wish they had, um, that connects and abstracts and links together the piece parts underneath into a whole that then a new user interface can be built upon that integrates all of that. And they're doing it in, it, it, it's kind of mind blowing. They're doing this, and we started working with them in the summer. And this summer they're already um, gonna be rolling it out to uh, in their tests. So, I mean, it, it, I've done these projects before and it's, it's so exciting to see what you can do with this technology when you wanna transform your business. It's just not possible any other way.
Peloton, you can't ride it without seeing with the power of the graph, uh, how it pulls all that together and into an amazing user experience. And then Adobe is using this union pattern, right? They've got just hundreds of teams that have their own GraphQL APIs. They all can come together. They can all be sort of sibling queries inside of a larger graph. So much easier to discover all the capabilities and start to look at opportunities to link them and compose them. So I'm gonna go real quickly here through the graph platform that empowers all this. But before I do, it's time to write that code down, take a screenshot um, and use it for the scavenger hunt. So I will leave that up for um, a couple of seconds while I take a drink. Okay, hope you guys captured that. We'll move on. So in the beginning, right? In our beginning and in a lot of uh, teams beginning, there is clients and servers in GraphQL, right? Um, and that's a great place to start. But as soon as we did that, we realized that you want to start capturing that registry, right? The schema, uh, or I should say capture that schema into a registry so you can start to analyze it over time and you can build checks. So what you're seeing here is the registry, it kind of essentially at the heart of a hosted service that we have um, and a set of, of tools that we call Apollo Studio. And you can think of those kind of as the control pane for the uh, plane, excuse me, for the graph. This is where we run schema checks against uh, schema changes to make sure that they're valid. It's where we bring in the traces and run observability analysis over them. It's where we give you access and, and viewing of all the, the history of your graph. Because as the graph becomes first class part of your development cycle, all the things uh, that you would want um, from other kinds of subsystems, like they show up here. So change logs and notifications. Um, and that's all built upon a set of tools below. Um, really encourage you, if you haven't seen a Google up uh, Workbench at Apollo, an amazing tool that lets you actually explore changes to a graph schema, especially a federated one, um, without even, um, without going and deploying anything, right? So you can just see what's it gonna do to the query plan if I change these types? What if I, how can I, how can I start to break apart a big monolith and, and break it into sub pieces? So it's fantastic. Now, the graph's not just a team sport, right? It's a multi-team support sport. So there are services and subgraphs uh, that you're gonna have. There's only three here. There's gonna be a lot more than three, I suspect in most of your graphs. Um, but the point of this is that um, if those are all valid subgraphs, right? The whole promise of federation is we can compose them together into a greater whole. And that's managed federation. And I will tell you that there is a lot of work that's been done here so that you don't have to do this work, right? Composition checks between all the different subgraphs. Are there type collisions? If there are, how do we resolve those? Who do we notify? Um, and a lot of work to create what we call the super graph out of those subgraphs and compose it. And not just in a one-time sense, right? But over time, the schema is always changing because successful graphs are evolving and they're evolving fast. We get to see the data as um, the, the metrics, if you will, not the data, but the, the usage and the changes that, that our customers use. And, and there is this incredibly strong correlation between companies that get a lot of value out of their graph, strategic value, and ones that change their graph a lot. So a lot of the tools that you see me, you hear me talking about are all built to help with that life cycle. We think it's a really important thing for teams to focus on. So let's, uh, let's zoom back in again. Um, here again in Apollo Explorer, um, and I wanna illustrate um, something I think is kind of interesting for collaboration. So we zoom in here. Um, this is you know this is where you touch the graph, right? This is where you write a query. If you're a developer and you explore to understand what the schema is, what the capabilities are. So, but if you see there's some nice little features in there, right? So as I'm writing the query, I'm getting a prefetched results over on the right. Uh, that's under sort of the, the blue characters button there. Um, and then on the right, you see a nice table view, right? Now, those are fantastic features for developers and they're really nice UI enhancements to uh, a graph explorer. But I want you to imagine that they're not just for developers. If we can, um, if we can make it easy enough for our other team members to come to the graph, the graph is truly gonna be a source for that common source of truth to describe all the capabilities, right? then guess who wants to show up and check it out? Product managers, designers, 
content strategists, all of them are interested in what data is available. What's the shape of it? What does it look like? How long are the common strings? I mean, if you ever have worked with designers, this is what they need to, to plan out the next features, right? And product managers the same. So it's really important to start thinking about using the graph and all these tools for collaboration purposes. And, uh, and we're gonna talk about that one feature on that in just a second. I talked about this schema over time, right? Things are always being, if it's healthy, things are being added and they're being deprecated. And um, we can push, we, can, we you know, as we see that through this, through these deploys, we can notify, you can set this up to go to Slack and emails. You can get web hooks, the custom that, that tell you about um, deployment. So you can then be, you can know safely that that version's in production or that variant. And you can then maybe say, turn on an AV test um, or, you know, celebrate. Schema checks, love schema checks. Um, we, uh, at my last company, just so many times that we have developer way over in one section, make a change, not knowing that there was a, uh, a direct dependency for a mobile app that was gonna break and that was gonna take us hours to either fix uh, or roll back. Um, so statically analyzing schemas to make sure that any change you make is safe. It's not gonna break a client. That's sort of, the base and, and you should be doing that. Everyone should be doing that. But we've done something I think pretty cool on the top of that in the last few years. And that's this dynamic sense of, of checking, which is you can, you can make a change to your schema that is, um, it is uh, provably um, unsafe in the sense that, that if there was a client using it, it would now break, right? But what if there isn't a client using that? What if, what if nobody's making, um, that request of that field that you're changing. Well, that's different, right? Um, then there's no harm. So understanding by uh, what we do is we look at the last N days of your real live traffic against your graph, and then you make a change. We can tell you exactly which clients would be impacted. Um, and maybe it's only a test client that's not being used anymore. Maybe it was an experiment that's now been turned off. These kinds of small things are not small when you get into the daily life cycle of managing large graphs. So. It's a great feature if you're not using that, I uh, really strongly recommend it. And then you see in the background, it's hard to see, but composition checks are also first class thing, right? So that's how do we compose multiple graphs into one and then have workflow around handling issues when they show up. Um, I'm briefly gonna, a couple more slides and then we'll do some questions. Um, observability, the essential nature of the graph is that you query for what you want, right? Which means you get to see exactly which clients are asking for which data. So there's a lot of um, searches and tools and capabilities within the product of Explorer and Studio that'll let you analyze that and, uh, and see that data. And that's really useful when you're trying to understand um, not just the pressure and the performance, but the actual use cases that your clients are using your, your uh, data for. And that data can go backwards, right? It can go to the clients. So we can keep track of, and we do statistically sort of historical data on the average time that it takes to resolve certain fields. And if you're making a federated query, meaning you're asking for elements that ultimately come from two parts uh, of your underlying system, they, had, they could have different performance characteristics. And so we can give you hints about, well, if I ask for prices, is that gonna invoke a price call or an availability call? Is that gonna slow down this call? Maybe I need to uh, think about where that shows up in my view hierarchy in order to optimize the performance. And then, you know, debugging performance, looking at those query plans, that's all part of this, right? That's how you turn observability data into actual true useful insight data. I mentioned earlier about collaboration and I'm super excited that just this quarter we announced uh, um, the contact directive, which allows you to annotate your graph at the team level. So you can say, hey, you know, this part of the graph is owned by this team. Now it is magical that I don't have to know that, that you don't have to know about the underlying services of the teams. But that doesn't mean you don't want to know sometimes. And often you wanna have a question you wanna ask about, maybe say uh, a new field or how to use a field, or maybe you wanna talk about performance. It's really great to be able to have ability to link uh, or provide links maybe to a Slack channel or a place that the uh, you can go and have a conversation. So I expect to see a lot more in this area in the months and years to come from Apollo because I'm a, a huge fan of how the graph enables collaboration. We are pretty much 
done. Um, I just want to give one plug quickly for the craft champions. Any of those champions out there, reach out to me, please. I've got the first part of the content uh, out in an ebook form. Um, it's quickly going to grow to be too big, so we're breaking it up. I'm going to put it on the website. There's going to be little articles, and you guys can share those and consume them. Um, and we're going to create a bunch of community discussions and conversations in our community forums about them. So please reach out to me if you're interested to know more. And that, uh, I will leave you with this sort of final slide. So thank you. Um, there's about 20,000 teams that are using um, our product all over the world, we're processing 6 billion queries a daily. And that is an enormous um, uh, responsibility. And we thank you for trusting us. Um, we love trying to help you all champion your graphs and get the value out of them that we know um, that we know you can. Reach out to me if you want to talk more. Um, and with that, maybe Q and A. Thank you so much, Dan. The audience loves it. You can hear their applause. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any questions from the audience? This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to hear from Dan. Himself. Oh, well, probably not once. <laughs> once today. <laughs> once today, yes. <laughs> Well, while we're waiting to see if any questions do come in, um, I, I do want to say, Dan, I think it's been pretty mind blowing uh, to hear how you know it has GraphQL has evolved over time, right? How yeah. it's, it started from this like one <laughs> monolithic graph to like these federated more or to these more broken out federated pieces, and I think it's really cool, and I really loved how you talked about how changing at skill is not easy and you know that as a baseline you need to change the mindset and how you're principling the approach i think is what you called it yeah um, yeah to, to like create like relationships between the types to really describe declaratively what you want to happen and uh then run things in a way that has great tooling that has solid visualization techniques that has a solid way for product and design as well to uh derive insights maybe come up with new product ideas i thought that was a very very powerful idea so that I yeah really heard thank of you before. i yeah. i love the two points you picked out because the the human factors of a graph. I mean, this is just what I've learned and I worked on a lot of projects on large scale change. And what you learn is, I mean, there's some tech advantage, right? There's some piece of leverage you've got, whether it's a React project or Kubernetes or what have you. But boy, it's about humans. If we wanna make a change, if, if the technology can really be as impactful as we think it can be, it inevitably impacts where we make decisions, how we collaborate, how we, and if you don't appreciate and lean into those kinds of things, what you get is, yeah, yeah, I've got a graph and it's big and it's kind of better than my REST API, but it's still <laughs> kind of not great. Um, so we really want to uh, encourage people that there's, um, and it's, you know, it's relatively cheap to think about these things. It's not yeah. easy to figure out the collaboration models, but that's why as a community, we can do it together. And what's, a, so, what's so rewarding for us is we hear the same stories at these kinds of conferences from from everybody which is really re encouraging in a way it doesn't mean it's easy but it's like yeah i ran into that too how did you handle this oh i tried this so let's all that's my big invitation is let's keep that conversation going um because really we're all of us pretty young or early in this journey aren't we yeah that's yeah. super exciting um dan i think that's a perfect note uh, to, to end the talk today. Thank you again so much for lending your yeah. time. We've learned a lot today and we really appreciate it. Everyone go check out Dan at Dan Moore on Twitter and check out Graph Champions. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to be listening so much, to this Dan. next talk. So Excellent. thank you all. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Dan. All right. Uh, get up one more time for Dan. All right. Next up, let me share my screen here. All right, next up, we have another great speaker um, from PayPal, Joey. Let me put you on the screen there. Hey, Joey, how's it going? Hey, Titus. <laughs> now, uh, Joey has been with PayPal for almost a decade now, um, and he is on the governing board for GraphQL Foundation. Uh, where he's pushing the limits for GraphQL. Now, before we get ahead and get started, Joey is a very, um, very interesting individual. He's a, a man of many talents, 
And I think in this case, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'm just going to show this picture of him right here. So this I thought was just a meme on the internet, but it turns out that's him in the bat costume in real life, skydiving or whatever you call it. I don't know if that's technically skydiving, whatever you're doing there. Um, pretty crazy. Um, he uh, is a base jumper, I believe, a skydiver. Um, and unlike most people who take hikes up a mountain and then hike back down, he goes to the top of the mountain and jumps off of it. So uh, with that said, give it up for Joey. He's going to be talking about unified GraphQL APIs at PayPal. Take it away, Joey. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the introduction, Titus. And the applause. Actually, I would say that uh, I was working in Italy um, one week, and my fastest commute ever was when I took a morning hike up to the top of the mountain, and I flew back down just in time for our morning stand-up. Probably my fastest commute ever. No way. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay. Uh, yep. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you're enjoying all the great talks at JS at PayPal. And thanks for tuning into my talk about a unified graph, creating a unified graph at uh, So I'd like to take you back in time to the beginning of our GraphQL journey. It all starts when GraphQL is released in 2015. It takes a little more time, but soon enough, developers at PayPal start experimenting with this new fantastical technology called GraphQL. Eventually, GraphQL APIs are created throughout the company, servicing various systems and user interfaces. But it's not too long before we start seeing some issues. As various GraphQL APIs are created throughout the company, so too are various styles of logging, error handling, naming conventions, and more. Everyone is having a great time, but we are really lacking some cohesion. This kind of freedom is great for fostering innovation, but you end up with such a wide, whoops, let me go back here. You end up with such a wide array of patterns and practices that it ends up negatively affecting the maintainability and consumption of our new GraphQL APIs. In order to move forward, we needed to intervene. Our first step was to create a set of GraphQL standards, a list of rules to play by. We needed to define everything from naming conventions to error handling and everything in between. We drew inspiration from our favorite GraphQL APIs across the industry and made it our own. Once we felt like we had defined some reasonable rules and guidelines, we quickly focused our attention to the next step. a set of tools that help our developers play by the rules that we had established. Naturally, we named this new tool set the GraphQL Fanny Pack, because who doesn't want a sweet fanny pack full of helpful tools? The Fanny Pack includes things like plugins for logging and tracing, directives for authorization and data classification, middleware for Apollo and Playground, error classes, and even a CLI for managing schemas and Apollo graph variants. By the way, I still have at least 200 actual GraphQL fanny packs uh, from the time that we overordered swag for our release party. So ping me later if you want to up your accessory game. Introducing the fanny pack was great, but we wanted to go a bit further and provide a way to create a new GraphQL API with just the touch of a button. Luckily, this was pretty, pretty easy to do with the systems that we have at PayPal. We just needed to define a new application template for GraphQL APIs, and everything else just worked. Now that our developers had a set of rules, a fanny pack of tools, and some ready-to-go templates, GraphQL adoption at PayPal flourished. But Mo APIs, Mo problems. Because GraphQL, uh, because GraphQL APIs were being created independently from each other, we ended up seeing very similar queries and mutations appearing all over, but implemented in slightly different ways. This resulted in a pretty inconsistent developer experience when integrating with multiple GraphQL APIs. Which brings me to our next problem. Why do you need multiple GraphQL APIs at all? Isn't one of the main advantages of GraphQL that you don't need to call multiple APIs to get the data you need? 
if only there was a way to bring many GraphQL APIs together and represent them as a single graph. Ah, yes, there is. Apollo Federation. In fact, Dan from Apollo gave a nice presentation right before mine. Because of that, I'm not going to go into very many details. However, anyone still in the dark, Apollo Federation is a specification for defining a federated graph, a graph that is comprised of, mul comprised of multiple subgraphs, each hosted independently. It is accompanied by a gateway module that can be used to accept incoming requests and make a query plan to determine the best way to make requests to all downstream subgraphs. Ultimately, this tech allows us to present a single graph to our customers while still being able to split the work across domains we already have in place at PayPal. Another very important feature of Apollo Federation is that it's language agnostic. Developers at PayPal are given the freedom to choose between Node or Java when creating a new service or application. It just depends on that team's preference. Having a gateway that supported a polyglot ecosystem was imperative, even though the clear choice is Node.js. Just kidding, but since this is a JS conference, I don't think anyone's offended. Scavenger hunt slide, guys. For anyone participating in the scavenger hunt, here's my code. Grab a screenshot. I'll leave this up just for a minute. All right, it's a pretty quick minute. OK, back to our quest for a unified graph at PayPal. Now that we have this fancy new toy, we create a new GraphQL gateway using Apollo Federation. Then we need to find a development lifecycle. How can developers onboard their subgraph to the gateway? What does the schema design and review process look like? How can they test their subgraph as if it were already part of the gateway? And what, step, what are the steps for pushing their subgraph updates to production? After we have solved all of these issues, most deserving a full presentation on their own, we felt ready to go live. We open a bottle of champagne, say a toast, and tell everyone at PayPal about this new awesome unified graph and how they can get started. Soon enough, APIs are being onboarded to the gateway and the graph begins to grow. This is precisely when more problems begin to occur. It turns out there are a few more challenges when trying to wrangle all of the graphs at PayPal and put them on a unified gateway. Who thought schema reviews would be so hard? Designing a single schema for an entire enterprise company is really just a massive data modeling exercise. I will, I will admit it's not an easy job and one that you don't really want to get wrong, so you spend a lot of time trying to, to get it right the first time. Then there's ownership. How do you make sure teams are implementing queries and mutations that really belong to them? A first-come, first-serve model is not a great strategy for delegating ownership in a, feder in a federated graph. You really want to separate your subgraphs logically by domain. And what happens when a team needs a query that doesn't belong to them? Are they simply blocked by the team that should own that query? And finally, there's the problem of scope. Which graphs should be on the gateway? Are there some graphs that really don't belong? To address these challenges, we need to ask a couple questions about each graph. Is this public facing? Do we know exactly how it will be consumed? I'd like to break it down into two different types of graphs. First, we have what I'll call data graphs. These graphs are, these are graphs whose schemas have been designed based on the data they are serving. They are often exposed to the public or a wide array of unknown clients. Because of this, their schema is generally very generic. 
They don't want to focus on specific use cases because they aren't exactly sure how the data will be used. Let's call these data-driven schemas. Then we have what I'll refer to as UI graphs. These graphs know exactly which clients they're serving and are able to tailor their schema specific for specific use cases that are already defined by the UI or the UIs they are serving. <clears throat> they have a use case driven schema. Let's go over data graphs in a bit more detail. The functionality provided by these graphs are essential. <clears throat> Think of things like user service or the payment service. These are core building blocks in all of which PayPal is built. The teams operating these graphs usually own the source of data that is represented in their graph. As mentioned before, these graphs are very generic, so they can accommodate as many clients as possible. The data they are serving dictates the design of their schema. Because these graphs are essential components, they need to be crafted with a bit more care. These schemas are subject to extensive review to make sure we get it right the first time. These schemas will probably live as long as the graph itself. These teams are in it for the long haul. UI graphs, on the other hand, are created by UI teams for the sole purpose of supporting the user interface that they own. These teams will create specific queries and mutations based on the needs of their UIs. These graphs are essentially just orchestration layers for better UI consumption. UI teams need to be able to deliver products quickly and efficiently. And that means they should not be subject to a lengthy review process. They need to keep moving. UI, graphs, UI graph teams should also not be responsible for servicing clients other than their own. This is out of scope for them and creates an unnecessary burden. Let's face it, it's a pretty daunting task to stand up a unified graph in an enterprise company that's useful immediately and actually delivers on the promises of GraphQL, like a single source of data, and no overfetching. If you provide some functionality and not others, then you'll likely be leaving your clients with the burden of making separate calls to fetch the rest of their data. That means you need to have a pretty well-designed schema for most of your data and service teams that have already fully implemented that schema. This could be a very long process, and your unified graph may never get enough momentum to take off. Maybe there's another way, a way of allowing graphs to be on the same UI graphs to be on the same graph as data graphs, so they can benefit from all of the other available data on the graph, but still extend when they need something specific for their UI. Maybe we could get started immediately and benefit from understanding what our clients really need in a unified graph. Well, we came up with a solution that attempts to solve all of these challenges in a very simple way. In short, we created a single graph with an extension platform and contribution pipeline to facilitate growth. Let me show you guys what I mean. First, you start with a gateway. You can, you can include a few small subgraphs or start with none at all. You get your first customer, a PayPal UI application that would like to use this fancy new gateway, for example. Because there's actually nothing on the graph yet, you kindly ask the UI team to create their own UI subgraph and orchestrate REST data calls the way they have been for years. We control the visibility of UI subgraphs via application credentials. This way, only app applications that the graph was intended for can access it. They don't need to worry about getting the schema perfect. They can iterate as much as they want. 
Since all types in a federated graph share a common scope, we need to give the UI subgraphs the freedom to name types without worrying about future conflicts. We accomplish this using UI namespaces. This consists of a top-level query field namespace, as well as the namespace specific to their UI. In this example, we have a subgraph that is meant to serve the profile UI. And as such, they get a query field called UI profile. Uh, UI profile returns their own query type called UI profile query. The type naming convention is pretty simple. It's just UI followed by the name of the UI it belongs to, followed by the name of the type. Their own query type is where they can define all the queries they need for their UI. Since this is a profile UI, they're going to need to display information about the current user. So we've added a user type, same naming convention, UI profile user. For now, we'll just provide a URL for the profile image and their display name. Notice they didn't need to namespace URL or string. Those are common types that they can use um, as they wish. An example query will look like this. It starts with their top level query field namespace, in this case, UI profile, and the rest is pretty much normal GraphQL. Our graph is now basically just a hidden graph that serves only one UI. It's really not too exciting yet. But don't worry, soon enough, more applications will want to join the party. They get their own UI subgraph and subsequent namespace. This is great, but we're really not solving the problem of unification. Everyone is on the same graph technically, but no one is sharing yet. That's OK, though. We have an opportunity here. As we onboard more and more UI subgraphs, we start to notice those same common queries and mutations being repeated. But this time, we're able to notice this much more quickly because they're all on the same graph. This is where we can leverage the use case driven schemas of our UI subgraphs to drive the priorities of our data subgraphs. Data teams only have so much capacity, and if they know exactly what they need to create, it's a huge benefit. For example, if we notice many UI subgraphs trying to implement their own user types, we can prioritize the creation of a user data subgraph owned by the correct team, in this case, the identity team, who is a service team and not a UI team. Then we can remove all the custom user types found in our UI subgraphs and have them point to the new user query that's hosted by the identity data subgraph. One thing to note here is that PayPal UI applications can access their relevant UI subgraphs as well as all data subgraphs. Data subgraphs are not locked down to any particular UI. They are meant to serve everyone. Over time, this refactoring will continue, and our data graphs will begin to grow. This also means that our UI subgraphs will get thinner over time as they leverage this growing data graph. Some UI subgraphs may disappear completely. Leaving you with a fully featured data graph whose schema was designed both by use case driven schema design as well as data driven schema design, capturing the best of both worlds. Now we can invite all of our friends to start using our new fantastic GraphQL API at PayPal. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Joy. That was very enlightening. <laughs> I love the way that you presented that uh, from the start to finish with uh, such a pragmatic viewpoint. Uh, and as a developer at PayPal as well, I definitely have been seeing that kind of transition from UI teams wanting to build solid products, but not having the time or resources to implement you know, 
or integrate with like a giant monolithic uh, piece of infrastructure like the single GraphQL uh, instance that you mentioned at the beginning. So uh, love, I really love that story of how you're pragmatically allowing these teams to grow in the way that they need to um, with their use cases in mind. But then at the end of the day, it sort of feeds into that single graph and feeds into a more unified model. Uh, I think that's really powerful. Uh, so thanks for sharing that. Um, let's see, uh, do we have any um, questions in the comments? I see Dan has been answering some of the questions in the chat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just share this comment from Dan uh, so you can see that too. Uh, he, he, he loves it. <laughs> we do have one question. Uh, Dan's asking, Joey, are you using server-driven UI concepts in your UI graph? Uh, we actually have a service that does just that. They'll get their own subgraph. Um, they basically will drive the, the, the entire server-driven UI at PayPal through their own subgraph. So you'll contact the presentation subgraph and get your UIs from them. That's awesome. Yeah, I have so many questions. Um, so for um, the fanny pack, um, theoretically, let's say we're interested in acquiring one of those fanny packs. Like, How, how does one go about acquiring one? I don't have a strong Twitter game, so I put my, <laughs> my snail mail down there on the bottom right. It's very, very hard to read, but it's uh, jnenny at paypal.com. Ah, Just reach out so to me. The worthy. If you, yeah, if you have any questions or if you really want one of those, um, you have to pay for shipping. But uh, <laughs> if you're in Austin, I'll hand deliver it. I do have literally 200 fanny packs. Wow. That uh, might might have to take you up on that offer. But for the worthy, if they can read the the email in the bottom right, then I guess they deserve a fanny pack. <laughs> it's, it's a test. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, it looks like Shruti also wants a fanny pack. <laughs> no problem, Shruti. I got you. So that's uh, that's one hundred and ninety eight now that you have to worry about. Well. Uh, thank you so much, Joey. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, everyone's loving it on the on the stream. Uh, yeah, uh, if, if you guys have any other questions, drop Joey an email. Uh, I'm assuming if they have uh, questions about your skydiving extravaganzas as well, they can hit you up there too. Um, <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much for your time. Oh, we've got an original fanny pack owner chiming in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right. Let's give it up one more time for Joey. All right. Next up for our, our last but definitely not least, we have Shivan and Michael. They're going to be doing a very exciting talk on web performance. Going to go ahead and add them up to the stream. Say hi, guys. Hey, Michael. Hey, Shivan, hey. what's up? Hey. Hey, no, I, I think there, I want one of those fanny packs. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm well, yeah, we'll have to hit him up later for that. <laughs> yeah. And Titus, I love your MCing game. Uh, you, I see you have got the, you've been all out, got the mic as well. Oh, yes. Okay. I, I stole my housemate's microphone. Just, just for this. <laughs> uh, you know, nice. so. <laughs> So I, I know uh, Shivan is a bit of a runner and also a huge Liverpool fan. Uh, they've been doing pretty good these days. So uh, that's very exciting. Yeah. And Michael, um, I hear you're also a really a coffee aficionado of sorts. You have some crazy gear. Yeah, yeah. I've got an espresso machine here that uh, <laughs> I got last year. <laughs> yeah, Very nice. <laughs> it's um, good and bad. Keeps me up at night. Yeah. You know, but... Yeah, I think it's coffee time, Michael. So I'm surprised you don't have, uh, you've not used the machine so far. Yeah, but, yeah, usually around two o'clock, coffee time uh, for oh, Shivan and I. Nice. We remotely enjoy a cup. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Yeah. I usually get and my coffee at four. Some people say it's too late. Mm. Okay. Tyrus, you mentioned Liverpool. So they had a game today, a really important one, and they won it. So I'm hoping uh, they won it, and so the talk will go nice. <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, this will be uh, uh, a start for many good things to come then. Uh, do you have a slide deck that you would like to share? Yeah, I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right. Sounds good.
Excellent. That looks good. And just just as a heads up, you do have a wide monitor. Oh, looks like it's formatting just fine. <laughs> Perfect. All right. It's looking fine now. It's looking good. Uh, cool. Take it away. And then I'll go ahead and get started. Thanks, Titus. Thank you. All right. And uh, hi, everyone. Hope you guys are having an awesome afternoon so far and everyone had their cup of tea or coffee. Um, Michael and I are going to be talking about web performance metrics today. But before I start, just on the, on web performance, I know I'd, I'd like to let you know that there are a couple other talks uh, in the JSConf that are related to this. So do check out. We have uh, Nikhil tomorrow morning. We have Arsini on Friday, who are going to talk about web performance through microfrontends. And we actually have Michael, who's going to come again on Friday and talk about how he loves making experiences more performant. So do keep a watch out for those. Um, for this talk, we, we, there's going to be nothing extraordinary you'll hear, but we wanted to touch on uh, touch on this since we, since we think it's an important part of web dev, but is often not given the attention it deserves. And I know in the past, I myself have been pretty guilty of that. Uh, but very quickly, yeah, that's me, Shivan, on the right, and that's Michael climbing those awesome peaks. Uh, we both work at PayPal as software engineers and we both love JavaScript. Um, so anyways, back to the talk. Now, as web devs, we spend a lot of time writing unit tests, functional tests, doing cross-browser testing. I don't think we spend enough time measuring our performance metrics. So we are hoping by the end of this talk, you realize that it's pretty important to measure performance metrics. Uh, and this, this talk is actually going to be a very intro level talk, which will cover these three points you see on the screen. So first, we'll try to understand why the performance matters, what are the metrics you should measure. And this has been uh, developed pretty well uh, by many, many companies over the past 10 years. And then finally, Michael will help us understand how we want to measure these metrics. Um, also, on, uh, as a side note, on the slides, you'll see that we've tried to add references to sources wherever possible. Uh, and those make for some great reading material. And Michael and I will be putting the deck out on our Twitter feeds later today. So if you guys are interested and you want those references, you can get them that way. All right, cool. Let's kick it off. And for the first section, you want to talk about why that performance matters. You know what? There are just a lot of websites. We have 7.6 billion people on Earth, but there are 1.5 billion websites. Basically, there are a lot of websites. And unfortunately, we are in the midst of a pandemic, uh, but that has driven a lot of users to use the internet and use websites much more. What's also a fact is that most people don't like slow websites. Nobody likes a slow website. And the expectation from users and visitors is very high that the, uh, the load times should be really fast. In fact, the bounce rate of users uh, increases by 32% for every one second increase in page load time. But I'm not the only one saying this. There are many companies who've already figured it out. And uh, this is a quote from, from Pinterest. It states that web performance can directly relate to money. Cool, so we know all this, but it's, I think it's also important to understand that web performance is relative. OK, so what do I mean by relative? Well, it's relative in a couple of ways. For example, it can be relative because you have a poor network connection or you have, a, you have 5G, so maybe the same site is loading faster for you. Or you have a really old device, so that matters. Some sites, if they're made well, they load their content progressively, and so the site may seem to be loading faster. Also, some, some sites load quickly, but they're like really slow to respond. And so it is relative in that sense. Web performance is also relative because of human perception, right? A lot of this is human perception. In fact, most web users perceive load times 15% slower than they actually are. There are also many tricks uh, that web devs do to make it seem like the website is loading faster. For example, spinners. We all love a good spinner. Uh, so it is about human perception. It is also about psychology, because 
web stress is real. Like how often have uh, we seen people get irritated by computers and by internet, especially on mobile. I think uh, I personally have faced this as well. I definitely feel more stressed. Uh, so web stress is real. Now there are also certain points of, of browsing or looking at websites where the stress level is high. And I think PayPal checkout is one of them. It involves giving personal information and it's dealing with money. So yeah, that kind of certainly makes sense. And you'll see, um, you'll see that PayPal is actually trying hard to be much more performant on web and to measure them, measure web performance metrics correctly. So you'll see Michael covers uh, some of this later in this talk. Uh, but cool. And the question is, what is web performance about? And from a web dev perspective or a website owner perspective, it can be many things. It can be about retaining users. It can be about creating stickiness. It can be about improving conversions. It can be about making the experience uh, not like watching a horror movie. <laughs> and in the at the end of the day, I think it's mainly about people and humans. Like you can imagine the stress level would also increase if uh, it's a clinic mobile site that's not performing well. So if I were to recap what we've discussed in the section so far, it definitely looks like web performance matters and that we as developers should take steps to address it. And overall for a site, I want to be able to reduce uh, load time. I want to be able to make the site usable ASAP. I want the, there to be interactivity and smoothness. And more often than not, it is about the perceived performance. It's about the user performance. Cool. So web performance matters. How do I do that? How do I do web, how do I make my web performance better? Actually, there are a million ways to do that, as you can see from the word out here. And we are not going to talk about that in this, in this conversation. We are actually instead going to focus on what are the quantitative metrics uh, that help us understand the web performance for our site? Because this is often where I think we drop the ball. So then this nicely puts us into the next section of this talk, which is what are the metrics you should measure? So if you think about web performance, there are mainly three bottlenecks with browsers. Uh, if you have a larger JS bundle, that relates to slower, slower interactivity for the site. If uh, your CSS is large, that relates to a slower uh, force paint. And if you're just sending a lot of TCP connections and network requests, uh, that equates to slower page load. Uh, so these are the uh, bottlenecks. Now, there are many great tools that have been developed over the past uh, 10 years, I would say, that can quantify these into metrics. And in this conversation, we're going to focus on one of those tools, uh, which is the Google Lighthouse tool and their performance scorecard. So this is an example that you see uh, on the screen here. Uh, but just as an FYI, there are many tools out there. And they all have like slightly different metrics that they, uh, they give importance to. And they all have slightly different definitions for each metric. But for the sake of this section and this talk, we're actually going to just focus on uh, Google Lighthouse. Um, cool. So you see a store scorecard. How do you read it? There are six metrics uh, that you see on the screen. We're actually going to dive deep into each of these six metrics. And there's some weightage assigned to each metric. Again, that's determined by Google in this case. And um, they're looking at internet trend. Uh, and what they perceive is, uh, uh, is important from a, uh, from a user's perspective. Right? So they have a weight associated with that. Uh, and as a general rule, I'll recommend that for even for small projects or uh, larger projects where you're delivering web experiences, you essentially want to commit to a reasonable quantitative score to target for those web experiences. So let's get in. We'll talk uh, in detail about these six metrics, and we'll try to learn more about them. Cool. So FCP, First Contentful Paint, talks about the first piece of DOM content. 
after a user has navigated to your page. So if you look at the images on the right, you'll see that it could be a loading animation. It could be the uh, the logo, uh, right? It could be anything that, that gives the perception to the user that the site is loading. Uh, one issue that's particularly important for FCP is actually font load time. So that's something that you'd want to pay attention to. Uh, speed index concerns itself with how quickly content can be visualized on the page load. Uh, so you'll see on the image on the right that um, site A has better visual representation and has better visual completeness than site B. So you want to build your site like that. Now, behind the scenes, it's actually using the uh, navigation timing browser API to process this and to determine the score. Um, and if you want a better speed index, you ideally want to minimize the main thread work and to try to reduce the JavaScript execution time. Cool. Number three, let's talk about largest contentful paint. Uh, it's essentially about the render time to the largest element visible within the viewport. Right now, this one is, again, very important from a user's perception uh, because naturally your eyes will go to like the biggest piece on the page first. So if you look at the diagrams on the right, in the first sequence, it's the CNN website that's loading uh, an article. And you'll see that President Biden's image is uh, the largest uh, element visible in the viewport, but it's coming in later. Now that's going to give you a lower uh, LCP uh, score compared to the second sequence of um, screens that you see on the bottom right, where it's a Google uh, results page for Larry Page. And you'll see that the largest element there was the block, which came in first. And the, the image, in fact, came in later. So you definitely want to be mindful of this when you're building your web experience. OK, two more to go. So the next one is TTI. It talks about how long it takes for a page to become fully interactive. And again, this one specifically has uh, slightly different definitions depending on the tool you use. But essentially, uh, there's an idea of having a long task, which is defined as the main thread being busy for more than 50 milliseconds. So uh, TTI is defined as the point in time when the last long task is finished and was followed by five seconds of network and main thread inactivity, which essentially means the user is ready to click and interact with it, and the thread is available for those browser events uh, to be executed. Right, so this sort of makes, uh, makes sense. You want your site to, be, uh, to become fully interactive uh, soon, as soon as possible. Uh, the next one is talking about total blocking time. Now, again, imagine if the user is clicking on the page, but the page is blocked doing some other task. It's obviously going to cause a bad user experience because your main thread is blocked. So uh, TBT actually uh, measures that. It measures um, the, the, the milliseconds you've, uh, you've used up. Uh, and uh, that are that, that are shown by the red section here on the image on the right, right? And essentially, to improve a TBT, you wanna uh, you wanna understand what your long tasks are, and you wanna determine them and optimize them. Cool. And if we talk about the last metric here, uh, you'll see that it, it's about cumulative layout shift, and in this GIF you see, uh, it's a really bad user experience because. Uh, the user is actually trying to go back and not order those 56 items, but because the layout shifted on him, he ended up ordering 56 items, aka web stress. So cool. Like I think we talked about some metrics, but it's also very important to understand how to measure these metrics. And for this, I'm going to ask Michael to come in and help us understand. Michael, over to you. Thanks, Shivan. Yeah, so uh, I'll be continuing us on our journey here of how to measure performance metrics in your application. And also, I hope to provide some more perspective on this as well from my experiences. 
And so by this point, we know why performance matters and what metrics are important, but how can you measure performance? And more importantly, how can you prevent rage clicks? Which I just learned in 2019, as you can see, web stress and poor user experiences. How can you prevent regressions from not just your front end app, but also from downstream services you might be calling? We use an array of measurement tools here at PayPal. And here's a list of many popular ones. A privacy is typically very important. So we do have limitations when using certain tools for real user data or real user monitoring. And that's why we have some internal tools that we use to measure real user data, uh, which we'll get into sometime later. But there are many closed and open source tools available. Some of the ones to call out here are a Catchpoint, um, Webpack, Lighthouse, um, Bundle Size for commit level CI, level audits, um, Page Speed Insights for RUM data, Boomerang from Akamai, uh, of course, Puppeteer and DevTools. And there's many more options here. And there are two main categories to boil down uh, performance metrics into. And one of those is in the lab and the other in the field. In the lab monitoring is also called synthetic monitoring and refers to simulated page loads in a controlled environment. Think about using web page tests, for example, or using dev tools, Google Lighthouse to monitor your application. These are synthetic or in the lab based methods. Monitoring in the field means monitoring real users loading and interacting with the page. This can be done through some of the tools I mentioned prior, like Catchpoint and also PageSpeed Insights. So in the field, first we'll dive into this. This is also called real user monitoring um, or RUM. Here we have real user monitoring and Catchpoint, and you can see a dashboard here. This includes real and synthetic uh, data, and Catchpoint is a very robust paid option for RUM. It's highly customizable and definitely recommend it. PageSpeed Insights on the right there uh, shows a RUM data without integration, and you can basically Google PageSpeed Insights, and you can go run a test on any site uh, which you'd like, and you can see real user data. Uh, and there are some limitations there, like users have to agree to send uh, data to Google, but uh, it gives you some really good insights. It uses the 75th percentile of the first contentful paint and the 95th percentile of first input delay. And that can vary from tool to tool. And so do keep that in mind when looking at the numbers. Um, there, there are many other options here, of course, for RUM, and I've listed a few of those uh, here, like Boomerang and Pingdom, for example. Now, in the lab. Monitoring in the lab is also called synthetic monitoring. Here, we're talking about a simulated user interaction in a controlled environment. In the case of DevTools and the performance chart or network tab, which you can see here, the controlled environment is your laptop. These audits are especially susceptible to variations from each run, things like your ISP, your modem, router, browser configuration, extensions, host of other variables here. Um, all can de determine the speed of your connection and the speed of your site and uh, your audit. It's important to keep this in mind. Web page test uses its own hosted and controlled nodes, which are placed in various locations, like in this run from Virginia here. And this is a better controlled environment, less susceptible to variation than your local dev tools run. And this was actually just purchased by Catchpoint. Uh, so you can see by Catchpoint here. So Catchpoint does use the same uh, waterfalls provided by web, web, web page test under the hood. In addition to Lighthouse, Web Page Test gives very thorough breakdowns and also opportunities for performance improvements as well. And you can see the Lighthouse uh, run there on the bottom, which Shivan also talked about. So we've used uh, Catchpoint for our synthetic monitoring. And this is a look at some monitoring we have done um, last year and into this year in a merchant-facing application here. 
at PayPal called uh, the App Center. And some regressions and improvements we've seen as well are shown here. Uh, this is running around 30 different nodes around the world, including in Australia, Europe, and Asia. And it's showing us averages of all these runs, which are constantly running in our app every five minutes. It's also simulating a 4G connection and an iPhone. And this chart highlights how challenging it can be to maintain improvements and prevent regressions. You can see with a new service uh, integration here in around November of last year, we saw a regression of about one second. Then shortly thereafter, we saw another regression um, with a downstream service issue. And luckily we did have some front end optimizations like a Webpack 5 upgrade code cleanup that did improve our numbers a little bit. And then after working with the a service owner, we were able to fix that service issue and get some improvement here. To dive a little more in detail with Catchpoint, Catchpoint Synthetic Monitoring gives you the ability to simulate users around the world, to throttle and simulate devices. It's highly customizable, and it gives you the ability to recognize regressions right away with the ability to configure performance-based alerts on top of that. Actually, right when we have a regression, we receive performance-based alerts from Catchpoint. And we'll look at an example of an alert in the next slide, which we started receiving actually after our downstream service issue uh, in around January, February of this year. So here's a look at uh, one of the emails that's going out to my whole team. Uh, and we're seeing uh, each, each node and the timing for each node. So you can see each of these runs is over eight seconds, which is our, our timing. And again, this is a throttled 4G test. Uh, and so we're seeing that uh, these nodes, and you'll notice that these are all far away from uh, PayPal's data centers, which we have mostly on the West Coast. Um, so I don't know, that, that can be something to keep in mind as well, you know, and that's something that you'd want to monitor because your users may not all be close to where your applications are hosted and where your data centers are located. And the great thing about these alerts is you can click right into uh, this icon here in one of these tests and you can be, uh, you land right into a full waterfall breakdown uh, with all numbers for every single network request on the client side, very robust detailed information. One other tool I wanted to call out for synthetic monitoring is a Puppeteer. And Adi Osmani did some great work uh, for a Puppeteer web perf. Uh, it's an open source um, library that he has, uh, Apache license. Um, but if you Google Puppeteer Web Perf, uh, you can see that uh, there's many different examples there of using Puppeteer to perform things like dev tools, uh, performance uh, traces, or lighthouse audits, or even just first contentful paint. You can uh, customize it however you want. And you can even move this to the CI. You can move this as a, a commit hook, a push hook, uh, and so that's another way to audit your uh, performance monitoring as well. So some pitfalls to point out of ROM monitoring is that privacy is important and you are limited by privacy regulations and requirements. You may be limited like we are here from sending user data to third party services. It's also more difficult to attain the, the depth of information that you would when using synthetic monitoring in my experience. Using synthetic monitoring, you can get a lot more information, like the size of each network payload size from the client side. Synthetic, synthetic monitoring does also have its pitfalls, though, like uh, that it is synthetic. You're not testing real users. And in addition, there are some security limitations in authenticated experiences. You may run into CAPTCHA or 2FA limitations, or you may not even be able to create user accounts you know, without affecting other analytics. There's some things to keep in mind of, and pitfalls that may apply depending on your technical circumstances uh, for each of these methods. 
But even though there are some pitfalls, I hope that you are seeing the benefits and the importance of monitoring your experience for performance. And I hope you see now why web performance matters, what metrics to measure, and how to measure those metrics. And with that, uh, we'll say thank you, and uh, we'll hand it back over to Titus. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. The crowd goes wild. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, I like that. You know, I, I'm so glad you uh, both did this talk on web performance because I agree. It's the unsung hero, right? When everything is working great yeah. and it's fast, no one complains, right? No one even notices that it's working well. Um, but I really like to how you both frame that as web stress or you know framing web performance as something that can have actionable items associated with it like the rage clicks i think was a very cool uh phrase i've never heard of you know user angrily angrily clicking on your website you don't want that i think that was a really good mission statement like don't have rage clicks on your site and here are some things that we can do to improve it uh, i love that um you kind of went through not just what the performance bottlenecks were but then how to measure them and conquer them with those live examples um i think that was really, really awesome. Uh, let me check the comments section on YouTube to see if we have any questions uh, for our distinguished speakers. We do have one comment. Uh, <laughs> if you have web stress, recommend trying the call map. That's funny. Maybe, maybe that could be a hackathon idea. If the web performance is slow, you can detect it and show an ad for the call map. <laughs> <laughs> the detection um, might deteriorate the performance even more. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Um, yeah, that was a really, really great talk. You know, I think in practice, it's always, it's hard to uh, sometimes uh, be constantly aware of this and enforce this, yeah. right, in day-to-day in -day development. So one question that I kind of have for you both is, um, like, what are some, like, I don't know if, uh, what, are, what are some workflows or what are some processes, if any, uh, you've been able to integrate into the development lifecycle itself? For example, as part of your continuous integration or delivery strategies, et cetera, to kind of, you know, check for performance uh, upfront. Yeah, I, I think uh, there are efforts in PayPal uh, to do this at every commit level, right? So, uh, essentially, with every code going in, we have mm -hmm. uh, we have an idea about uh, you doing unit testing, doing mm -hmm. functional testing, but also then doing performance metrics measurement. I think that's going to be, that is important uh, and right. it should be part of our CI CD pipelines. Yeah. yeah I, awesome. Just to add to that, um, I definitely recommend bundle size uh, to perform a CLI audits and you can configure it to audit every single emit from your Webpack build. And that's something that we have integrated to our uh, commits and uh, actually our pre-push hook for that one. Um, but then also we're using uh, Webpack Bundleizer, of course, which is great to v visualize your Webpack build. And we've uh, integrated um, Lighthouse uh, runs into our CI job as well. So mm -hmm. we're, we're performing some Lighthouse audits, and that's been uh, really great. Uh, that's awesome. And if you use Lighthouse and the Lighthouse API, you can also input a, cu a custom performance budget as well so you can you know yeah. really uh, keep track of where you were and any regressions that have happened that's awesome yeah uh, it'd be cool to hear a talk about that at some time maybe uh for for next conference <laughs> that's that's really fascinating um oh yeah himant also mentioned that uh firebolt which yeah is an internal tool at paypal for dealing with lighthouse integration in the CX, that's the one yeah works really well. mm -hmm. okay awesome Thanks a month for that comment. Cool. Well, unless we have any other questions, let me check. Oh, people are just excited that they have uh, you have Lighthouse access in the CI. So people are loving that. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. We're right at time. I want to, um, the, the crowd is going wild again, uh, as you would expect after such a, an amazing talk. So thank you both so much. And if people have questions, where should they contact you on Twitter or elsewhere? Yeah, I think contact me on Twitter. Michael has his own website, which and Michael, you want to talk more about that? Yeah, uh, you can go to my website and that pretty much has my Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, michaeldurfee.com, uh, or you can at Michael Pietro on Twitter. 
Nice. Awesome. Nice. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Wow. Can you believe it? That was the end of our first day. Uh, thank you all so much for attending our first ever virtual and public conference. We had so many great talks today, ranging from our CTO's keynote about the tech landscape, um, how we're able to create JavaScript bundles at runtime, right? Crazy new JS web APIs that you can be utilizing your apps right, na right now, Heartbeat, Bluetooth, uh, NFC, all this good stuff. Um, how you can make a payment app in five minutes. Uh, we talked about how you can um, uh, use GraphQL uh, learnings from web performance. And of course, we had special guest speakers like Dan on Apollo Federation. Um, but we also do want to extend a special shout out, not just to the speakers that have presented today and worked really hard on their presentations, but also to all the volunteers that have been working around the clock to make this happen behind the scenes. So before we leave today, um, please don't forget to tweet your codes uh, and learnings, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel at uh, the button below. I think it's like right over there. We're gonna be dropping the new video for tomorrow's uh, continued live stream uh, in the channel. So subscribe today and you'll be able to uh, keep up to date on that. Uh, until next time, it's been a pleasure. And uh, we'll see you soon, starting tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. PST. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>